up and running. Hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for tuning in to our 12th, wow, I can hardly believe it's 12, our 12th demonstration, conversation, and sale of artists' work here at Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery. I'm Andrea Fisher, and uh, I've been in business here in Santa Fe for 27 years. And this is our first experience with filming and interviewing potters from uh, our wonderful group that we represent here. The reason that we're doing it this year is because Indian Market has been canceled. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Indian Market, Indian Market is a huge sale of Native American arts and crafts. It started approximately 100 years ago. Uh, their 100th anniversary would have either been this year or next year, but hopefully that 100th anniversary celebration will, will take off. And for many of the artists that exhibit their wares at Indian Market, um, it, there, it is a substantial um, part of their annual income. And for some of the artists, it's their only annual income. And in an effort to not only bring you something that was a little different, because we were doing these many hour um, demonstrations and conversations so that you had a real in-depth feeling about how pottery is made, information that you really can't get anywhere else. And if you come to market, you know, standing in front of someone's table and asking questions and not knowing the questions to ask sometimes are, are, you know, it's a little uncomfortable for everyone. So instead, I get to ask the uncomfortable and the comfortable questions too. But today we are going to have Sherry Tafoya. She is from Santa Clara Pueblo. We are really happy to have her and her beautiful work. And uh, she will be here on camera now for several hours. We started a little late today because uh, we are now, we have a few potters whose schedules uh, demand that we uh, be flexible with our hours. Sherry is our, our person today, but tomorrow, tomorrow we have Jackie Shativa. Jackie is from Acoma Pueblo, and she does this wonderful corrugated style, an ancient style where the pieces were used for cookware. And it was quite a few years ago that her mother, Stella, decided that she was not going to use these for cookware and put them in the firing, but let the beautiful white clay stand on its own. So Jackie will be here tomorrow, and she starts at 11 o'clock. The next day, Friday, we'll have um, Sammy Naranjo and Melanie Gutierrez. They are both from Santa Clara Pueblo, and Sammy does this really wonderful scraffito work, very, very complicated scraffito work, and Melanie, his partner, makes beautiful turtles in the same style. On Saturday, Friday. excuse me, on Friday, <laughs> on Friday, we have Carolyn Concho, I get my days all mixed up, uh, we have Carolyn Concho, and she is from Acoma Pueblo, and she does painted mostly seed pots and some plates in the style of the Mimbres people, the ancient people that lived in the southern part of New Mexico and migrated to Acoma Pueblo centuries ago. And Carolyn is really lots of fun, and I think we'll have a, yeah, I think you'll enjoy watching her make and paint uh, these wonderful Mimbres designs. And then next Tuesday, we'll have Candelaria Suazo, also a Scraffito artist from Santa Clara Pueblo, and who does red and black and, and combinations 
of the two and some really, really wonderful animals that she puts on her pieces. These programs run Tuesday through Saturday and will end at the end of August. And uh, we've certainly had a lot of fun making them. Now, if you uh, miss some of today's, you have to go to the grocery store. I know all those kinds of things happen. And if you miss part of this program, or you want to see any of the other, the 12 we've done before this, uh, you can tune in to YouTube. Go to YouTube and search for Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, and every single one of those demonstrations will come up, including this one, but this one won't come online until a couple hours after we finish at 4 o'clock, more or less. Uh, but anyway, one of the reasons that we're here today is to sell Sherry Tafoya's pieces because our sales here make a definite impact on the families uh, that are no longer or unable to um, show their wares at Indian Market. And since there is no government comp compensation, they don't have unemployment insurance and all those other kinds of things, they're all self-employed. As a result, they uh, have no other source of income. And so today we are you know, in the process of helping them out. Now, if you want to see Sherry's work, plus we've also added to Sherry's something a little bit fun. We have a piece by her mother. We have a piece by her grandmother. We have, a pe we have four or five pieces by her auntie and a, a half a dozen or so pieces from uh, her cousin. So, you know, pottery making all over the Pueblos of the Southwest is a family affair. So we've decided to add some of the illustrious members of Sherry's family into our exhibit today. And one of the things that we do is we answer your questions. So if you're joining us on YouTube and you have a question, don't hesitate to type it in and we will make sure that um, Sherry or one of us here make, gets to answer it for you. And if you like what we do, uh, if you go to YouTube and, and find us and subscribe and, and uh, pass that information on to your friends, we would be most appreciative. And we hope that you will enjoy today's presentation. So one other quick little message Dan, if you're working, no, I didn't know the plant uh, that I had displayed yesterday was a relative of the sesame seed. Thank you so much for your information. And I'm glad you're tuning in because um, you're probably our most regular customer. Thank you. Anyway, without further ado, I would like to introduce Sherry Tafoya from Santa Clara Pueblo. Sherry, can you say a couple words about yourself? Uh, uh, I'm from Santa Clara, and I've been making pottery for uh, a long time, since I was little. So I grew up into the pottery when I was little. Little, little, little? How little? Oh, probably like in um, grade school we started. Mm -hmm. Grade school. And, and what are you going to do for us today? I'm um, going to make a pot. Well, good, good. Let us, let us see what you have there. This is my clay. And did you go to the store and buy that clay? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I did. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you fun in us? No. Oh, you're fun in us. No, I get the clay from the hills in Santa Clara and the sand, too. And so I when, soak and mix them all. When you get the hills... No, excuse me, get the clay from the hills. Um, is this a one-person job or? Oh no, we have to take all the men to help us dig because it's really hard. And, and, and you pick them up where? On the, on the street and <laughs> say, can you no, come and help No, I have my brothers and my cousins oh, and my nephews and everybody go, oh, so, we all go. So you wrangle your relatives. Yes. Yeah, to go help you collect yes, the clay. Yes, I do. And, and are any of them potters? 
Yes, most of them, they, they did pottery, but right now they don't do it. Oh, but they're still willing to help you out. Yeah. Well, that's really nice. I have my brother come and help me. Yeah, uh, and and uh, is it a long way to go to get the clay? Oh uh, no, it's not too far. It's right there on the res, so you know we don't go too far. And is are there roads nearby, or do you have to carry this stuff out? Um, you well, we can drive up to it, but we put them in baskets or in buckets and throw it in the back of the truck. And and, and bring it home and dry it. And how much do you get at a time? Oh, a lot. Enough to last for the whole winter. Oh, oh So we'll okay. start right now and build up my supply. And then we'll um, dry my clay out, put them away for the winter, and take out as much as we need each day or whenever we're going to make our clay. So how many pots do you think you make during the winter with that clay? Oh, it depends on how big I make them or how <laughs> small. So I make at least, I do a whole tub full of clay uh -huh. and sand. So that will last me maybe four to five months. Well, we hope the winter doesn't last any longer than that. Right. And it depends on, you know how cold it gets to yeah. in the winter, because it's hard to fire in the winter, because yeah. it's wet. Yeah, oh yeah, wet, and it stays wet, because yeah. it freezes and doesn't defrost. Right. But um, when you say that you you make a whole tub full, uh, what do you mean you make it, what, how do you prepare that clay? Oh, we have our clay, we break our clay up into small little pieces, and. We yeah, well, put them in the tub with water and soak it. It has to be dry. What does it look like? Do you, oh, do you, I didn't do, bring in a sample. I should have. Uh, is it soft one. or is it's it? It's hard. Yeah. When we first dig it out, it looks like a nice chocolate bar, like a Hershey bar. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it's real with dark or, and rich with like or, that. With or without almonds? Without. <laughs> well, <laughs> you get rocks. So sometimes you have yeah, little almonds or peanuts in there. No? Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. And we dry it out, and then we soak it. It has to soak in water for a couple well, you of say hours. You, you dry it out. Is the clay damp when you dig it out? Yes, of the it's ground? wet. Uh huh. It's wet, and we put it out on like tins or on tables or uh -huh. wherever outside, so we can dry it out. And it takes a while, a couple of days, weeks, maybe for it to dry. It depends on how the weather is. And um, we soak it, and then we strain it through a screen, a uh -huh. very fine screen. So that takes a long time to do. And why, why do you strain it? To get the little rocks out. Uh -huh. Are there other things like sticks or weeds or seeds? Yeah, sometimes you get little like hairs in the clay when you're pulling it out, you know, uh -huh. like. Like, like a vein or something. They only come in veins. The clay comes in veins, uh -huh. so you have to really dig a lot. So if you go to the hills to get it, are you digging down into the ground? Yes. Or are you dig, digging it's, like across into the ground? Well, If the, it's on, a, you know, like a side of a hill or a cliff. Yeah, it's like under, it's like on a hill, and then it's way down below. You have to dig way down into the ground. Uh-huh way deep and then the hill's way up here and it's like down here. Yeah. One thing I forgot to mention when I was talking, if you are interested in Sherry's pieces, the easiest thing to do is to go to our website. I mean, the cameras will go over to her pieces and her family's pieces, but if you go to our website and then click on artists and then on T for Tafoya and then scroll down to Sherry, uh, and click on her name, all of her pieces will appear. And they start with the most expensive ones at the top, and as you move down uh, through her pieces, the least expensive is at the bottom. Now, Sherry also, on one of her pieces, if you take a look um, and click more information, there's a bio about Sherry, and it will tell you that her mother um, 
was May Tapia, which should ring a bell. Maida Tafoya. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, my Maida. Maida Tafoya, M-I-D-A. And her grandma was Christina Naranjo. And her auntie was Teresita Naranjo. And her cousin um, is, wait a minute now, it's back here in my, Stella Cheveria. Right. There we go. So, but in that in that bio, all those names will be listed, and you'll be able to see them on the the um, camera. And I'm sorry, Maida, I apologize. <laughs> I should know better. So, you know, what? What? All of a sudden, I see this like little bow. What do you? How did that happen so fast? What did you do? Oh, I just found out all the air bubbles and. Put a hole in. This is the gourd that I smoothed my pottery out with, and this is the tongue depressor that I smoothed the outside with. And and, uh, and so you, uh, the gourd you uh, found in a field, or uh, someone gave you one, and you yes. broke a piece off. I am. And, uh, and the tongue depressor you uh, pilfered from your doctor's office. Uh, no, I don't know where you got it, <laughs> but that is in the realm of possibility, you know. Uh, and you have other tools there too? Yes, um, these are my tools that I use for carving. Uh-huh, uh well, I'm sure we'll get here. Well, yeah. Oops. These are ready to be carved. Oh, okay, well, we'll get to that later. Tell us about that piece that you're making. What? Oh, this what is it? just gonna be a little bow. Uh -huh. And I have my little pipe pan with newspaper so I can hold it so it doesn't crack in the middle but when I'm turning it around like this to mm -hmm. smooth it out. And then I'll get a, another piece of clay and coil it. Well, it's a shock for me to see these little pieces because the pieces that we've had over the years have all been, you know, at least eight inches tall, right? Big, and uh, and there you go with uh, uh, small pieces. How un, how un, um, unnatural it seems for you to be making small Little pieces. Yes, because well, it's they're but, easier to carry right now. Yeah, easier stuff, to carry. You know. And also. Um, that way people will and get an idea break of what you the, do and how you do it. The making. So I, this is for my coil now. And then just rolled it out like this with my hands. And then I lay it down on my newspaper and roll it out. Just like a tootsie roll or something. And well, a, a lot of people... Um, everybody has, has their, their own way of uh -huh. rolling the coils. And the idea that you can actually roll it and it comes out the same thickness all the way right. around takes many, many years I need a practice. real long table and I make big ones because the coils are long, so, yeah. you know, I need a long table. Yeah. Well, Sherry, who taught you to make pots? I learned from my mother and my grandmother, and I watched my aunts and stuff when they were war working on them. So, as a grade schooler, yes, uh huh. And then when I was in school in high school, we had pottery classes. Oh, you did, where'd you go to high school? I went to school in Espanola to um, McCurdy or um, Espanola High, Espanola High School, yeah. uh huh. Yeah, and we had classes there, so we took classes over there. Huh. But by then, I already knew how to make, so you know, it was no problem. Well, it, it, at Española High School, were there a lot of kids from Santa Clara Pueblo there? Oh, yes. Mostly well, all of them. Mostly all of them. Huh. Yeah, everybody graduated from Española. Or either, you know, McCurdy or Santa Cruz in those days. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so. So I'm just pinching this onto the pot. So who was your art teacher? Um, she was a, 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 a lady from San Juan. Oh, uh -huh. we learned from a lady from San Juan, and then we had a lady from Santa Clara too. They were older ladies, uh -huh. and they all did potteries. Yeah. So we learned how to do Santa Clara way and San Juan way. And the the San Juan way is 
different from the Santa Clara way? Yes, it's it's a it's a little harder, I think, because you have to paint, and I'm not good at painting, so I don't do painting. But you're really good at carving. I can but vouch for that. Carvings, uh -huh. what we all did in our family, from my grandma to everybody, uh -huh. you know, everybody carved. So I I picked that up real good. But that's interesting that, uh, that it's a public high school, and yet there were Native American pottery classes yeah. given in them. And it was a while ago. I mean, I'm sure you didn't graduate from high school in the last five years. Uh, and uh, that was, you know, something I would think would be very unusual. Mm -hmm. Now... They don't even have that in schools anymore. They don't? No, they don't teach them nothing oh. no more like that. No classes in pottery are. Oh. When oh. my son was in school, I used to go to his school and teach him how to make pottery in grade school. Yeah. So, you know, I've done that too. And, and how old's your son? My son's already 30-some years old. Oh, yeah, like Derek's age. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Great. Yeah, so he, you know. Does he make pots? Yeah, uh, he used to when he was a little kid, but now he don't. Yeah. But I make him help me with the pottery, so he knows how to do everything yeah. about pottery. Well, how many uh, people live at Santa Clara, kind of? Oh, there's about probably, I don't know, maybe, what? 30,000, 50,000, I don't know. <laughs> well, probably, There's a lot of them. Probably not quite that many. Maybe not that many, uh, but you know, quite not. a lot. Maybe if you take a zero off the end of that, maybe 3,000. 5,000 people 5, 000, in, in uh, that neighborhood. 10, maybe. Uh, I don't know. And how many That's active potters are there? Oh, right now, there's not very many. Most of the, the potters that were famous, they're, they're, they're all gone now, so it's, there's hardly nobody making potteries right now. Older ones, older ladies, my mom still makes her pots. Uh -huh. She does, good for her. Yeah, she, she does her own stuff too, yeah. Well, we won't, we won't reveal your mama's age because she may not like that. <laughs> uh, but she's an older lady. I think that's a very nice description, and please call me the same <laughs> an older lady yeah so you know everybody in our family my brothers sisters they all um try to make anyway uh-huh you know. and do do some of them work on the pueblo or off the pueblo doing something other than pottery um yeah well no well, like, do they work at the bank or? Everybody yeah. works at home. Uh -huh. Well, well, now you have to. You're well, in choice. Yeah. Mostly, you know, my son works for the Pablo, so, you know, he's just right there. Uh -huh. He don't have to go too far to work. And yeah. I have another daughter, and she works in Espanola, so yeah. she don't got to go too far to work. Yeah. Now, are you a grandma? I'm a grandma. I got. I'm a great grandma too. You're a great grandma? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. She's only three years old. Oh, yeah? yeah well, I... is there some pottery making in her future? Oh, yeah. She sits on my lap when I'm working in my room, and she helps me make a mess. <laughs> so, you know, she, she already knows what the clay and stuff are. Uh -huh. She plays with it. I let her play with it, let her get dirty yeah. or whatever, you know. Well, I know so many of the potters said that, yeah, their parents let them play with the clay, but as soon as they were done playing with it, they snatched that clay back and put it back in the, uh, their, wherever they stored yeah, their clay. We tell them it's not so, to waste it. That's right. It's so precious because mm -hmm. it takes so much time yes, to it clean is. it and mm -hmm. to go dig it. And, I mean, after all, you've got to talk your brother into going with you. Yeah. Uh, in your case, huh? We get all the family to go. Yeah. Well, do you sort of make a day out of it? I mean, like, yeah. do you have a picnic lunch? or Yeah, we take our some... stuff and sit up there and dig and dig all day. We have to. Yeah. But we go early in the morning so that way it won't be so hot. And then we go for our wood to fire. To fire. And, and do you go higher up in the mountains for the wood? 
Um, no, we go up to the canyon and get the wood. We get cedar wood. Oh, we uh -huh. use cedar wood to fire. Yeah, I do anyway. Uh -huh. And um, slap wood at the Gopuna at the sawmill. And so mm -hmm. you uh, um, stockpile the wood so that you could fire in the winter time. Right. Uh -huh. Yes, if it gets snow or rain, we have to cover it up so that way we can keep our wood dry, yeah. you know, in order to fire. Cause and, you know, when you fire, do you have, like, some people I know have firing sheds and other people have special places where they do their firing, which they uh, try to keep dry right. uh, over the winter time. Do you have a special place where you fire? Yeah, I do. I fire outside in the back of the house. I have a in the backyard. Little, That's a special place. Yeah, little corral. I have it all fixed uh -huh. up, and I fire in there. Uh huh. Yeah. Great, because I know all your pieces are ground fires, aren't they? Or yes. some of them kiln fires. Yeah, they're fired outside. They're all fired outside. Fire well, that's outside. that's something and, you know to keep in mind. And that tradition uh, in some of the pueblos, like Akama, who does a lot of kiln firing, that mm -hmm. tradition is dying, and very few people even know how to do it, much less do it mm -hmm. uh, with their pieces. And people have different ways of. Firing yeah. too, yeah. you know. Everybody's all different. Yeah. You know, I know the way I know the way we learned from our mom and grandmother the way they fire. So that's the way I do it, mm -hmm. their way. You know? And that's the way you'll teach your, your yeah. kids. Now, or besides um, your thirty-seven-year-old son, uh, is your daughter, or I think you said another son, are they interested in making pots? Um, no, my daughter never really got into it. Yeah. She didn't really like to do it. Well, what about any of those grandkids? My grandkids, they do. Yeah. My two older grandkids, they would come to in the market and they would have a kid's um, part of it, you know. Uh-huh, yeah, the there's kids. a whole competition, uh, competition among the so kids. Competition, so they would yeah. make pots and we would bring them and they would sell. Good. Mm -hmm. They ever win any prizes? Um, no, they didn't win any yes. prices yet, but, you Not know, yet. since they were little, they were doing it, too, so they would, you know, but now they all work, so they don't make pottery no more. Oh, they don't, so your grandkids don't make pottery anymore? No, they don't do it oh, anymore. Oh. They all work now, so, you know, they, uh huh. Yeah, you know, and then now... To make pottery and sell, it's not very good, and it's been very slow. You know, for the last few years, it's been real slow. Oh well, that that's really too bad to hear because you don't want that art ever to be lost, right? Ever, and I think part of the reason is it's easier to get up in the morning and get dressed and eat some breakfast and go off to a job that starts at at eight o'clock and you get a, an hour break for lunch and then you get out of there at five o'clock mm -hmm. and you drive home and live the rest of your life. But pottery making is really hard yeah. and it's very, very, very labor intensive and... It takes a lot of time. You have to really have patience to sit there yeah. and do it, you know. And not only does it take patience, but it takes an, an incredible amount of skill. I mean, some people, you know, might be able to do all the other parts, but if you turn out something that is not beautiful and in the eye of the beholder, uh, you may not be able to sell it, and uh, and you know, you you don't have a regular paycheck coming in. Right. Uh, things fluctuate, and I mean, that's part of the reason that we're we're doing this is because potters don't. Um, artists in general don't have regular paychecks and it's you know hit or miss. We and work for pot after pot you know we yeah. live for you know pot after it, pot. Is that the only job you have? Yes. And so how, how many hours a day or what's your day look like oh, when it comes well, to making pottery? This last these past three years um, I only work in the afternoon so I babysit in the morning uh huh. Then I work in for the afternoon. For that granddaughter who's yes. going to be the next one making pots. Yeah. Yay, yay. And then I watch her in the morning and then I work in the afternoon. So it's kind of hard because I don't have that much 
time to work, you know, as if I had the whole day to work. Uh -uh. Yeah, so I have to do a little here, a little there, and it takes me a little bit longer now to finish my pots than if I can work all day. And then it'll be easier. So you're adding another coil? Yes, I'm putting another coil on. And do you, do you score the clay on the top, or do you just put the coil right on top? I just put it on top of it. Uh-huh. Or if you want it to go in, you put it on the inside. If you want it wider, you put it on the outside of it. Uh-huh. So this one, I'm going to close it in, so I put it on the inside of the pot. Uh-huh. And, and what are you doing there? I'm pinching the coils to the to the clay, so that way it don't come apart. And then you just smooth it out. Use your fingers and smooth it out. And then just continue building it up as high as you want. When, when you're making a pot like that, do you uh, uh, worry about the air bubbles? Well, yeah, that's why I pound on it and squeeze it and stuff to get the air bubbles out. And if um, you do have air bubbles, what what happens then? Well, they could pop, could pop into firing, or you'll get cracks. So all that work that you've done, all the work, because the firing's the last. Thank part you. of the process, it could be completely destroyed and is absolutely worthless. Right. Oh. Uh, nobody wants to buy a broken pot. <laughs> yeah. Who wants a Who wants a crack pot? Yeah. We have enough crack pots so in this world. you have to like maybe make enough to where it won't break. So you have another one to, uh huh. You know, to have depend on fire. Yeah, but you got to take your chances. Oh yeah. So do you leave all those nice finger marks in the in the pots? No. I just move everything out. This is just too. What's amazing how evenly that and symmetrical that pot is even at this stage. Yeah. You if you didn't do it symmetrical, would it be hard to make it right? Probably Later on. it won't come out, you know, no pots are the same anyway. Yeah, there we go. You're absolutely right. No, no pots, pots are, are the same anyway, which is, you know, which is really, you know, part of the, uh, the joy of having things that are handmade, that, you know, you never wind up with the same piece same over, piece, and so over, yeah. and over and they over and over. It may look yeah. the same size and the same shape or whatever, but mm -hmm. they're all a little different. Yeah. And some of that's out of your control. Uh, because I know we've had people request special orders and they want something that's 10 inches tall. Well, it depends it's on the clay. It's hard to get yeah. to the same size or the same shape. And the reason is, is that it shrinks so much. I mean, if that, those two pots, those two little bowls that you have, that one that's in the front is maybe, what, two and a half inches high? Yeah. Uh, how high is it going to be after it's fired? Um, when they dry, they shrink at least maybe, I say, an inch. Oh, So okay. if you want it, like, to be 10 inches, you have to make it at least 11 or 12. Uh -huh. yeah. Because, you know, it shrinks when you... When, you, when, when, all the water's leave, when all the water's uh -huh. leaving the clay. And then you sandpaper, and that, you know, takes off a little bit more. And then when you fire it, does, that, does it shrink a little bit more then? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. I don't think it shrinks anymore after you fire it, but it, um, it gets lighter. I yeah. notice that when you fire, it gets lighter, huh. your pot. You know, so you try not to make them too thick. Well, with some you have to make them, rel the larger ones you have to make relatively thick. I usually make them about, I think this is like about a quarter 
inch thick that and I in make in your my particular pots. case, you have to make them a little bit thicker because if you're going to carve into the surface, uh, you don't want to carve Through into it. the middle of the <laughs> pot. <laughs> yeah. So, no, you know, it depends no holes on how allowed. thick you carve. Yeah. Depends on how far you go down. Yeah. Have you ever cut through? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you still cut through after all the, these years of experience? Well, sometimes I do. Not, not as often. Not perhaps. as often, but, yeah. you know, there's some days I do. I still mess up, you know. Yeah. I mess up my pot sometimes, so then you have to do it all over again. You oh, know, dear. sometimes it takes two, three times in order for you to get it just right or the way you want it. Yeah. So sometimes I can polish one pot and if it don't come out the way I like it, I'll do it over. If it don't come out then, I'll do it over again. And then if uh -huh. I don't like it, I'll just leave it and do something else. Yeah, do something else. <laughs> and come else. back to it later on. Wow. Or the next wow. day or so. So, yeah. so this is going to sit like this for a while because well, it's know, too wobbly to add more on there. Gotcha, because it will collapse. It will fall in, yeah. yeah. So you have to, you know, take little breaks from it and let it dry and then, yeah. you know, build it well, up. Well, will you come back to it in a little bit? Yeah, uh, I'll come back and put another one on there. And how, how long do you let pieces dry? Um, depends on the weather. If yeah. it's nice and sunny, it'll dry maybe within two days. In winter time, it, it takes like maybe about three to four days because yeah. you just you don't um, put it on nothing. You just leave it out to dry, you know, normally. And, and so before you add another coil, it will be five minutes, ten minutes, a half an hour before it's uh, ready? When it kind of gets a little firm. Yeah. It firms up a little bit. It dries out a little bit. So then. it's a matter of touch, not time. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, I think that maybe while it's drying a little bit, Derek might be able to uh, show some of Sherry's and her family's pieces. Uh, and will you let us know, Derek, when that uh, time is, is coming up? And in the meantime, uh, after um, you talk about some of your pots, will you return to making that pot or will you begin to carve on the other one. What, well, would, what would you prefer? I'll start this one carving uh -huh. it uh -huh. while this is setting. While it's setting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So by the time I get this fixed up, then I can put another coil and then let it dry again and then, you know, and then carve this one out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, that way you have many pieces going at the same time? Yes, sometimes. Is that, is that true at home, that you have many pieces going yes. at the same time? I usually make, if I'm going to do big pots, I'll usually make two or three of them all at once, but it'll take me maybe a whole week just to finish all three of them, just wow. to make it. Uh -huh. Because, you know, I have to set and set and set, you know, yeah. so it takes a long time to yeah, it takes make a, a pot. Time. You know, uh -huh. It's not right away, you know. Well, I think when uh, people check out the pieces that you have and they see that small pot, I think they're going to be really surprised how much bigger the pieces are that you have here. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, I'm like I said, I'm just really surprised to see something uh, that uh, you're going to demonstrate your carving on uh, compared to the ones we're usually um, seeing. Yeah. Now, uh, the kind of tools that you're going to use to carve. I mean, do you use a chainsaw or? No. Uh, do you use a <laughs> I have a knife, just a regular kitchen knife. A kitchen knife, there we go. One of those fine, yeah, uh, just a regular specialized knife. tools. Yeah, uh, the and I have my pencil, regular pencil. Uh -huh. My exactos, I have a flat header and I have a sharp knife. And that's it. And my little tools here, my little screwdrivers that I use. Screwdrivers are precision you... um, tools. Oh, ah. Uh -huh. So this is what so I carve. So do you put with. screws in your pot? No. No. Oh, okay. No, but no. they I have used this to carve out to clean up the pot. Yes. Uh huh. I carve with these and that, and that's it. That's all I use.
uh, for carving. Well, you know, over the last two weeks, we've seen some really interesting uh, um, tools. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, seen um, old pizza pans and forks and kitchen knives that are worn down. Uh, one of my favorites is the lid from a can of Skoll chewing tobacco. Yeah, and uh, we. You know, we, it's really fun to watch uh, how people have taken what they uh, need. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be showing you some of Sherry's work and some of her family members' work. And like I said, if you want a full description of the pot, its size, its price, if you go online at um, andreafisherpottery.com, click on Artists, then click on the letter T, and all the T potters will come up, and scroll down to Sherry Tafoya, and you'll be able to see all the pieces that she has. And they are in descending order of price, with the most expensive one at the top and the least expensive one at the bottom. All right, well, I am over with Sherry right now. And let me get that on screen, there you go. All right, so Sherry has one of her pieces here, and so Sherry, you wanna tell me about this? No, well, this is a red car pot. Um, it has the, the water serpent on it, the avenue on it, and this is the head, this is the lightning, and these are the mountains, and the water, and the kiva steps. So what are kiva um, steps? These ones are the kiva steps. Yeah, and what, what do they represent? They're the steps on the kiva. On outside on the steps mm -hmm. as you climb in. And I've yeah. been making this for a long time. This is all I do is the water serpent. And some pots may have feathers on the top, but this one don't, so. Well, um, and then a couple questions. Um, you always do your serpent in the other direction from right. most people. Right. So is there a reason for that or just because? No, it, it just, I don't know, it just happened to come out like that, that I put it that way. And it's a, it was a lot easier for me to design that way instead of the right way on the right side. So I don't know, maybe I'm backwards or something, but. <laughs> I don't think so. I just I just think you, you have a way and I, I think it's really nice that you do something that's a little different than your family. Mm -hmm. So we have a piece that's over here that's by your mom. Yes. Yeah, you want to grab it and tell us about it a little? This is the same with the water serpent and the kiva steps in the water, the mountains. And hers is this other way. And you could tell the difference. I just kind of made mine a little bit more fancier than hers. But we all learned her way up carving and yeah and so I, I notice your mom has kind of softer edges than yours yours mm -hmm. seem somewhat sharp right. whereas your mom seem a little more curved mm -hmm. she um that's her way of carving you know I, yeah. I i like my more mm -hmm. a cleaner finish and mm -hmm. nicer you know yeah but yeah. hers are nice too you know that she yeah. has nice good carve on hers Oh, well, cool. You want to grab another piece and tell us a little bit about it? And this one, my grandmother. Oh, we found one of your grandmas. Yeah, this is her, one of her pots. And they're almost similar, like my mom to hers. They're almost the same. The design, the head, I think. And it's all the same designs we all learned together when we were little. And they taught us the designs. So well, uh, did you learn from Christina or? Yes, we learned from her too. We would go visit and she'd be making pottery. So we picked, I picked up a lot from her just watching her make and my mother the same by watching them. And you just have to sit there and watch. They don't, they don't like to be asked questions and, you know, or how do you do this or that. So you just have to sit there and watch them. 
Yeah, I, b I believe that's the Native American understand. way of learning, is the, whoever is the teacher does so by showing, and mm -hmm. the, the learner is the one that is watching, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, uh, the teacher saying, oh, this is how you do this, this is how you do this, you, it, it's done mainly through observation. Right, you just sit there and watch, and don't ask no questions. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah don't bother me, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, um, and so uh, Christina, who is your grandma, right. uh, is, isn't she the sister of Margaret Tafoya, the most famous person from Santa Clara Pueblo, pottery-wise? Yes. Was it hard growing up in a in a family of famous potters? Um, no, not really. No, not for me. It was it because you know I learned at an early age, and it was a lot of fun. You know, I had fun while I was learning how to do it. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. um, and so what's your favorite part about making pots? Um, is it the making? Is it the carving? Is it the polishing? Is it the digging the clay? I like to polish. Oh, you like to? I like, I, I get more uh, out of polishing than uh, making is hard. So, you know, uh, but mostly I like just the polishing. And uh, do you polish the whole thing at once? Or do you do it in sections, or how, how do you do that? Uh, depends on what size it is, how big it is, or how I have it designed, or whatever. So sometimes I might do half, sometimes I might do the whole thing. Um, it just depends on what I'm working on. So, for instance, this one that is spinning around right here, you might have done the, the top polish right. as one, and then maybe the bottom, or the middle section is one, and then maybe the bottom is one? Well, I do the top first, and then I'll do the whole bottom, the whole part of the bottom, all at once. Mm -hmm. So, it has to be a nice day, it can't be too hot to polish, because it dries them out too fast. Mm -hmm. So, we just heard from Joe and Naranjo and Kevin Naranjo yesterday, that mm -hmm. the best time to polish is like four in the morning. Early. Early, it is because it's cool, so it doesn't dry off. Is that true for you as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. I do. I get up early and I sit there and work and yeah, because by noontime, summertime it's too hot. But the best time is like the winter because it's not too cold, I mean too hot. And mm -hmm. you know, it polishes a lot better. You don't have to be so fast like yeah. that. Like well, summertime, you have to well, you gotta take your time dust. because obviously you have to uh, you you have to not have those nasty polish marks sometimes mm -hmm. that people don't like. Um, but you also have to do a good job and you have to do it fast at right. the same time. Right. So it's kind of a you know double-edged sword a little bit. You have to go fast, but you have to do it well right. uh, at the same time. So what happens if you don't polish a piece very well? Uh, they don't come out good. They don't look good. It looks might be dull looking or you know mm -hmm. something and you know so I sit there and it takes me almost one pot like that would take me almost three to four hours to polish okay and so uh, how many layers of polish do you do is it one is it um, several 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 and how do you know when you're done uh, it just feels it, it right just, or it looks right? Yeah, you know when it's, when you have enough paint on it. Yeah, you have to put a lot of paint on it in order for it to sink into a pot, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it polishes well. Okay, and it um, streaks. And so when you say paint, um, it's not paint that you go to Home Depot for or Lowe's for, correct? No. It's, it's a slip. Slip is watered down clay that you've made into a quote unquote paint, correct? Right. right. Yep. It's a red paint that I um, just put water. It's just mm -hmm. water and the paint. It's like a little clay, it's a clay paint. Yes. Yeah, and so um, I see here the piece that we have of yours is red. Correct, mm -hmm. and there's some pieces here that are black as well. Right. Um, is the same slip used for the red and the black? Oh uh, no, I got two slips that I use for the red. The red is more darker than the one for the black pottery. Okay. Yes. And and the black is achieved in the firing process. Is that correct? Right. And and so how would you fire a piece that is uh, red? Oh, it takes 
probably, I say maybe about an hour, hour and a half, because for the red, you just let the fire burn out on it. For the black ones, you let it burn to it turns a certain color, and then you pour the manure over it, and the manure, you smother it out, and it turns it black. And I think the, uh, the reason that it turns black is because the manure requires more oxygen to burn, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and it can only get it from one source, which is inside the fire, and that's the clay body itself, and it's an oxygen reduction process. Right. So, yeah, well, I mean, these are absolutely beautiful. I love the polish on these guys. It's really fun to be able to see your mom and your grandma's work next right. to yours. Right. Um, you know, does that uh, kind of bring up good memories of being as a child and, oh, yeah. you know, watching them work? And, mm -hmm. and so you obviously developed a very unique style from, from them as well, um, even though the materials are the same and the tools are effectively right. the same, right? Right. Everybody has their own tools that they use, and you know, it's all kinds of stuff. Anything you can, anything you find that will work, it works. <laughs> yeah. So you know. What's What's your favorite strange tool that you've found? Oh, sometimes a nail. I would use a nail. So you use a nail. That's your. Does it Does it have to be a specific? type of nail? Or? No, just it could be an old rusted nail and I could, you know, use it for something. Or write my name with. Yeah. Sometimes I forget to put my name on a pot, so I use a nail to write with. Yeah, yeah well, well, thank you so much for that, Sherry, and okay. I'm going to take it back over to Andrea so she, she can talk to you guys a little bit. All right. Thank you very much, Sherry. Right, thanks. Well, Sherry wanders back over here. Uh, for those of you who uh, heard yesterday that we're having a fire in the hills right around Santa Fe, uh, it's called the Rio and Medio, the, the, the river in the middle. Uh, the fire is 0% controlled. It's burned, oh, 20,000 acres. Yesterday we had a storm, lots of lightning, um, lots of wind. Uh, the wind pushed the fire sort of away from the community of Rio and Medio and up, up the mountain. But it, you know, the only way that area is accessible is for the firefighters to walk in about two or three miles to get to where the fire is. And because of the lightning storm that we had yesterday, helicopters could not drop any water on it. So the fire is uh, still going and. It's unusual to look out the windows from the gallery and see the sky that is a little bit on the gray side because there's a lot of smoke. In fact, uh, they've talked about having uh, uh, people with uh, any sort of respiratory problems to stay inside. But we'll see what happens today. We did get some rain, so the rain helped a little bit, but uh, maybe that... Uh, fire will be under control soon. It's been extremely dry here and we thought, oh gee, how are we getting away with this with no rain and no fires? Hallelujah! And then sure enough, the next day uh, one started and we have no idea, or they have no idea how it started at this point. It might have been a lightning strike, but it's in a pretty secluded area in the mountains. So uh, a little up date on the Rio and Medio fire that is happening in San Fe County. Uh, it's about five miles north of the ski area, if you're familiar with us, with the mountains here. Anyway, let's hope, let's hope for the best. Well, Miss Sherry, um, you got to talk a little bit about your pots and uh, with Derek, which I think was really fun, but I want to know some other things, too. Um, did you ever go to Indian Market with your grandma or your mom? Because they must have been in Indian Market. Oh, yeah, they did. They go. Yeah. When uh, we were younger, they would come. And uh, we would get up early in the morning and be down here by, what, 5 o'clock in the morning and stuff. 5 a.m.? Yes. You mean before the sun came up? Yes, we would come down early. And they would, well, we would stay here all day. 
stuff. So yeah, they did participate in, in the market. And, and how old were you when the, you first went to Indian market with your family? Oh, I was probably in grade school. In grade school? Maybe fifth or sixth grade when was, we would come. Was there something that you could do? Because I know that Indian market on Saturday literally starts when the sun comes up and ends at five o'clock and then you know, nine o'clock on Sunday until it closes at five o'clock. And so um, that must have been a really long day for you. Was, I mean, were there other kids around? Um, our brother or my sisters would go too. So all we would do is um, just walk around and check out all the shops around, you know. Yeah. And play all around, and run around and... Uh -huh. Eat. <laughs> and eat, right. Did you eat the fry bread? Oh, yeah. And the Navajo tacos? Yep, all and, that. And the yeah, and the green chili, chili stew. Chili stew. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always. Well, the, the, the sad part about Indian Market, not only from a financial standpoint, but also from a social standpoint, is this was a time when families got to see each other uh, again and again. And uh, it was a time for being social and a time to renew friendships because you may have sat next to a person in a booth uh, that came from another part of the country mm -hmm. and the only time you ever saw them in your life was when you went to Indian Market and you could renew all those friendships and, and see all the dances that happened that were parts of other cultures and all the artwork and and uh, and maybe even hear about tribes that you didn't even know existed uh, in this country and uh, it was a, a social experience and a learning experience and and two really fun days and you know that's didn't happen this year which is really sad yeah yeah but maybe next year maybe next year. Uh -huh. Now, do you, have you shown your work at Indian Market recently? No. No, no. not recently? No, I haven't yeah. done the Indian Market. Yeah. No. Well, that is, uh, that's really uh, tough because now there are, what, 2,000 artists, 1,500 to 2,000 artists yeah, displaying. It's a lot of work. competition, and you know, it's not yeah. like it used to be last, you know, in the old days. It's not like that no more. It just got too modern right now. Yeah, well, you know, I've heard that from a lot of people. Um, that, you know, when it originally started, it was just sort of like uh, the native people who display their work in front of the palace of the governors. Right. And there were people who sat on the women, mostly women, who sat on their blankets on the ground, both in front of the Palace of the Governors. And the Palace of the Governors is, um, that one building is the northern border of the plaza in Santa Fe. And it's the oldest government building in the United mm -hmm. States, built when New Mexico was a territory, built, you know, sort of when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. A long, long time ago, mm -hmm. maybe not quite that long ago, but uh, whenever the Spaniards came, they uh, set up a government here with uh, a governor who was appointed by the King of Spain and built this incredible, wonderful house for him to live in. And uh, now it is a museum, and the Native Americans who sit outside and sell their wares are an extension of that museum. So consequently, the museum has some rules about who can, who can show their work mm -hmm. there. And you know, one of the rules is, is that you have to be, whatever you're selling, you have to be the person who made it. Right. And uh, which is really quite wonderful. But you know, uh, Indian markets started out about the same size as what you see underneath the uh, Palace of the Governors now, and it has grown. It instead of it being just on that one block, it goes on for miles. I always right. tease everyone about their booth being halfway to Espanola, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there's so many streets with so many yeah. exhibitors, and 
The organization that puts it on is uh, called SWAYA, Southwestern Indian Art Association. And um, while the first word is Southwestern, the, the, the Native Americans who are exhibiting are from all over the country, uh, from Alaska to Florida, from Canada, Maine, all mm -hmm. the way to California and everything in between. And I think some of it is the result of the fact that you said that there aren't that many potters at Santa Clara uh, like there used to be, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, uh, too bad. But yeah, and they are doing modern stuff. They're doing fashion shows and they're doing photography. It's and, just too crazy now. Yeah, and people who make movies, cinema, and not really focusing as much on the traditional Native American arts as um, they used to. Mm -hmm. So, but if there aren't any potters, well, they won't, the representation won't be there at all. So you've got to work on that granddaughter, that great granddaughter of yours, mm -hmm. oh, uh -huh. yeah. and, and make sure that she carries the, the torch. Yeah. Now, she likes it. Yeah. Now, did you grow up at, at Santa Clara Pueblo? Um, yeah, well, we moved from, we were born in Utah, so we moved when we were little back uh -huh. to Santa Clara. So, yeah, we mostly grew up in Santa Clara. Yeah, well, your, uh, your mom is from Santa Clara. Your dad, too? Yes. And, yes. and, and why did you go to Utah? Oh, uh, he was in the service. So, oh, you know, yeah. we were on an army base in Utah where uh -huh. we were living. And then after he got out is when we moved back to Santa Clara. Yeah. So well, you know, mostly we grew up in Santa Clara. Yeah, well, the, the armed forces has always been a really good source for people to uh, finish school and then have a place to have a job mm -hmm. and to learn a trade and all those kinds of things. But in, And also, I'm sure Utah was a very different experience. Were, were you old enough to understand that experience or uh, oh yeah yeah because when we moved back we were i was already like maybe seven or eight uh, uh -huh. so you know we, yeah. we have the outside life and the pebble life so, yeah <laughs> the so, white man's so life. you live did you live in the in army housing in, in Utah? Yeah, it was on the base. It me. was on the base. And oh. so moving from the base to the uh, to Santa Clara, how was that different? It was really a lot. And on the base, you had house, water, lights, gas. Oh. Then when you moved <laughs> back to the ranch, you didn't have none of that. You did, so there wasn't? So there was no light. Well, there was power, but no running water, you know, so, you know. Well, what, did you, what did you do for water? We had pumps, water pumps. <laughs> uh-huh. water pumps, so you go outside and get your water, bring it in. Oh. We had to so there was like a in. community well. Yeah. You didn't have to d d dump a bucket or dip a bucket into the Rio Grande. No, no. No, that was... Not that far. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we had, you know, there was water, running water, but, you know, you just didn't have it inside. Uh-huh. Does that mean you had no plumbing? We didn't have no plumbing. We no bathroom? No bathroom. Outhouse. Outhouse? No outhouse. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, yeah, we, it was kind of weird. You know? Well, it, and, and roughly what year was that? Oh, that was must be back in the uh, late fifties. In the fifties already. Sixties, yeah, so early sixties. In the sixties, you 60s. had no running water in no. your house. No, that's really hard to believe in in yeah. this country because you know once the uh, the Second World War was over, they started building all those tract houses, mm -hmm. and everybody was moving to the suburbs, and you know it was. Uh, the June Cleaver dream of having your special um, kitchen and and, uh, uh, and and a lovely landscape front yard and mm -hmm. and all these incredible houses, but on the pueblos they were oh, no. forgotten. No. We, yeah, we were. That's how we grew up, you know. Yeah. Wow. And it was hard, and then later on, you know, our parents they started building the houses. 
the HUD houses, so they finally got one. So finally then we have, you know, running water, light, gas. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, is that still true of people who live uh, right along the, the plazas of uh, inside um, Santa Clara Pueblo? Yeah, people have water They now have running water in their houses stuff, now. Yeah. Oh. It got modern. More modern yeah. now. You're modern <laughs> now. That's great. So um, when you moved back to the Pueblo, I bet, was it a surprise to see the dances? Because they probably don't have too many native dances on in the Army no. base. <laughs> there was something to see, yeah. But, you know, we grew up with it, so it was no problem. Do you, do you ever dance? I did before, once before. Uh -huh. That's about yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> and what dance were you in? Oh, that was the harvest dance. The harvest dance. Right. Corn dance? No, harvest, harvest dance. dance. Which And how were the two different from each other? Because when we're harvesting, when they're dancing, that's the time for, you know, the harvest and stuff. And then the other one is, um, what did I say? Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, I know that a lot of the dances have something to do with the seasons of the year, mm -hmm. and they're sort of reminders that it's time to plant, or it's time to co go collect everything out of the fields, and um, they celebrate the seasons. And um, that um, is part of the dancing. And, and I, I should tell everyone out there that might be listening that the dances are not entertainment, not at all. They're part of the Pueblo religion, and mm -hmm. that um, they celebrate their creator and their important things in their religion uh, by dancing and, and praying. Uh, and so, if you go to the dances, you are not going to see any spectacles or any sequence uh, or any music other than the drumming and the singing of um, the elder men. And um, it's really a magnificent experience if you're out here when the Pueblos have dances. And, and one of the things you can do is call the governor's offices to find out uh, about their feast days. And your feast day was? August 12th. August 12th, did right. it happen? No, no feast day this year. No, oh I bet that, there, there's another um, social event that doesn't take place. Um, I mean, of course there's the religious part of it. It would be like a Catholic going to a mass or a, um, uh, so are, are a, a Jew going to the temple. Mm -hmm. um, their church happens to be the great outdoors and the way they worship and recognize and praise the parts of their religious culture is through the dance. But also what, what happens is it's a social event uh, that uh, it... Uh, is a way, it's, it's a time when family members come back to the Pueblo. It's a time when you get to see relatives that mm -hmm. might live far away. Uh, it's a time to eat and yep. to enjoy each other's company. Well, how about showing us a little bit about um, carving that, that pot? Or okay. is it more appropriate to add on to the other one? Um, well, it's still a little bit wet, yeah. Okay, well then, set. I'll then, do then, this and um, all I do is get my knife and just scrape the outside of it for a while, for a little bit, just to kind of like smooth it out, because it has all kinds of holes on it. So you don't sand it until it's completely dry? Until so it's dry. This is kind of wet. Well, this is what I do. Scrape them a little bit. Do it 
this way. It's kind of too wet. It's a, is it too wet to carve? Yeah. I should have took it out earlier. Dried it out. But I should have brought my hair dryer, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever uh, done that? Used the hair dryer? No, because it'll dry it out too fast and it might crack it. Oh, because it's shrinking so fast, yeah. huh? And you know, and then you only fire once and you have to fire twice. And then sometimes they break if you yeah. fire it twice. And why would you fire it twice? It, it may not come out right or something. You know, if there are, say, fire clouds on your pot, Do uh, if you fire it again, will the fire clouds go away? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. They'll, they'll crack. So, uh -huh. it, it, you know, you have to do it good right away. So you want that surface a little smoother than just the right. the coiled pot? How come? It's, I don't know. It's just easier for me to do, to design. Uh-huh. And it was kind of too wet. Then the pencil um, digs into the clay. So what you do is you... Draw your design on first with a pencil? Yes, I draw it with a pencil. This is kind of too wet. So, The first, first part I put is the head and the arrow. The, the arrow. lightning. The lightning. That's uh, an arrow is lightning? Yeah. Well, uh -huh. I call it an arrow, but it's lightning. It's <laughs> lightning. Yeah. And the lightning comes out of the Ivania's mouth? In the mouth. Okay. So a lot of the things that are on your pots are water symbols. I would yes, assume. that's all I do. It's all you do are water symbols. Yeah. And uh, maybe... How come they didn't work this year? The feather. These water symbols. And it's been so dry. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so you start with the lightning bolt. Yeah, uh, with the and, head. And the you head. Start it uh -huh. with the head first. And then with the lightning. And the head of the storm. Yeah. And then I just put my other designs on. So do you draw the whole design on the pot before you begin to carve? Yes. Now, does the pot tell you what it wants on it, or do uh, you make that decision? I just do whatever I want. Uh-huh. Because I've heard from some people that that there's no choice in the matter. The pot sort of says, do this to me. And if you try to do something else, it just doesn't work. Well, yeah, if you want to try and do something to make a, another pot exactly, it don't come out. <laughs> it's very hard to do. Yeah, that's why special orders are really tough. Because, um, you know, you may see something that you like and you want the artist to reproduce it and Sometimes that's just not in the cards. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it don't work the way you want it to work. Yeah. Or a special shape, you want a special shape. Yeah. And you try to do it, and sometimes it don't work out, you know. So you and put it away and do another one. Yeah. Yeah, because you can, you're can. you not going to be able to control what the size is because it will depend on how much water yeah. there is in the clay. And uh, 
also um, the shape. I mean, if that clay is just a little bit too wet, it may be sagging. And, and you don't you want know, to go not, this way, it might go, go this other way. way, or, you know, it's just, it just depends on what you're doing and, you know, what you want to make. I just make and whatever comes out, comes out. How many pots do you think you've made in your lifetime? Oh, I don't know, probably thousands and thousands of them. Thousands. So there's a big hole at Santa Clara somewhere, huh? Yeah. That uh, you dug all that clay out of to make all those pots. <laughs> yeah, and it's not very easy. Yeah. Very hard to dig. Well, I, I told, well, someone asked me about what my goal was in having this gallery, and I told them that my goal was to have New Mexico below sea level because so much clay had been dug out of New Mexico that you didn't see any of the mountains anymore because they were all made into pots, and I sold them all in this gallery. <laughs> I bought and sold them all. And I sold them all, and they went to all sorts of places all over the world. That was yeah. my goal. I don't think I'm going to achieve it, though. <laughs> the mountains still seem to be there. Well, there's only special ones you use. Oh, yeah. Special mountains. Special hills. Okay. This is almost ready to carve out. Now you said that you had white sand in your clay. Yes. What is, what is that white sand? Is it like beach sand? Well, they said it was volcanic ash. That's what I heard. Mm-hmm. But they would say it was the volcanic ash. Well, we do have evidence that there are lots of volcanoes uh, in, in um, uh, northern New Mexico, that's for sure. It's the, the um, like on the hills when you go like Pewaukee and around that area, uh -huh. you see white on the mountains, on the hills. And that's the sand that we use. Uh -huh. Is it pretty fine? Yeah, well, sometimes it's really hard, like rock. Sometimes, and then you have to break it up. And if you're lucky, you'll find a good um, batch that's really soft and powdery. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so it has to be, you, you have to screen it and everything when you're, when you're going to mix it with your clay. So you got to sift your clay and sift your sand. And then you just put the sand on the bottom, and then you put your clay in the middle, and then you put some more sand. And we put it on the floor. Yeah. on a canvas tart and um, mix it with our feet. Oh, I bet that's fun. You, you mix it with uh -huh. your feet, but it takes hours and hours to, oh. uh, to so do it. So a, a gym membership isn't necessary. No. All you have to do <laughs> You'll is, get plenty is of mix exercise. You'll get your exercise <laughs> that way. Huh? Yeah. Wow. So that's how we make the clays with our feet. And how much, you know, clay to how much sand? Half and half. Half and half? Half and half. Wow. I do half and half. So one, one is pretty easy to collect and to, uh, and to clean, and the other one, the sand part, and the clay part is a lot harder. Yeah. They're both hard work because you have to climb and bring them down in buckets, and it's a lot of work. Your shovel, your picks, and everything. Is there, has anyone at Santa Clara ever gone to the craft store and bought a 25-pound bag of clay and, and uh, it's tried not to the work same. with that? Mm -hmm. that? It's not the same. It's, and, and why isn't it the same? Do you know? Well, this is, our clay is more rougher than the ceramic clay. Uh -huh. The ceramic clay is real soft. Ours is kind so of without rough. the temper, it doesn't have the 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 temper the, the yeah. commercial clay. And I don't think the paint would soak into it. Oh, yeah, yeah this, that's yeah. the paint would soak into this, you know. 
But it isn't paint. It isn't paint from it's Lowe's red. or Home Depot. No, no, it's oh. this right here. This is the polish. Yeah. This here is my polish. And you can tell it's a red paint. From the red from the red rocks? Right. Are they near your house too or do you have to no. to go someplace else um, for them? We uh, we dig this up there like by San Domingo. Uh-huh. You get it from the people from San Domingo? Just down the river. Um no. You have to dig for it too. Uh-huh. Yeah. But to but dig. you um, Santa Domingo is really close to Santa Clara if you go down the river. If yeah. you go by way the highway, it's what, an we, hour's we, drive? Like, you know how by Lava Hada Hill, how it, the hills uh -huh. are red? Yeah. This is where this came from, but uh -huh. way down underground you have to oh, uh -huh. dig. Yeah, so it's not really easy to get anything. Do and then I just mix this with water. Do you ever go to Jemez? Because I know the red rocks are everywhere. The highway's red in, yeah, in certain but places. No, we never got nothing from there. I never yeah. did, anyway. Yeah. Some people may have, you know, well, they probably do, the Jemez people, because they use the red, right? Yeah, they use yeah. the red slip as well. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But, it, you know, it's not quite the same. I know that, you know, when Maria Martinez was sort of in her early years, in the 1920s and 30s, the red slip that she used was a real, real dark red. But you just don't see that anymore. Maybe it was just one special place. I mean, not yeah. even at San Ildefonso, uh, you don't see that dark red anymore. Yeah, it, it, you know, you have to get it when you can get it and keep it, you know, uh -huh. save it. Yeah. Because, you know, you well, might not be able to find any more next time, you know. Well, I know that San Ildefonso relied on Cochiti Pueblo for some of their slips for that nice warm sort of buff color and probably for the that dark, dark red also. Did Santa Clara trade with uh, with uh, Cochiti as well for materials? Um, yeah, you know, instead of paying money, you know, they trade. You might trade pottery for it. Mm -hmm. Because I know that your uh, uh, your auntie, Teresita Naranjo, uh, in some of her earlier pieces, there are there's some of that real dark red slip on them. Mm -hmm. See, and that's probably stuff from long time ago. Long time ago. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding with the, uh, the slip from, was from Cochiti Pueblo and it came from the area which was Cochiti Lake and when Cochiti Lake was put in, that sl those slip beds disappeared in the 1950s. Oh, oh no, so they dammed the Rio Grande. And they, they drained it. <laughs> yes, and they drowned the, the slip, literally. Uh, because their Cochiti Lake is really quite big and it is one of the sort of storage places for water along the Rio Grande. But I remember uh, talking to, uh, oh gosh, what was his name? Um, Lewis, um, Rita Lewis's husband. I'll remember his first name in just a minute. But Rita, True. Lu what? True. No, Drew was, it was Lucy's son. This is Rita Lewis, who was from uh, uh, Cochiti, and her, she, her husband used to tell, he's the one who made all the, the mermaids after they put Cochiti Lake in. And I um, always asked him about how, where in the world the mermaids came from, because uh, if you uh, go to, Coach of the Lake, do you ever see any mermaids? And uh, he, and he told me, it was so funny. He mm. said, you know, if you go to the lake at midnight and you have a, a, a little pint of sipping whiskey, and if you sit on the banks of Coach of the Lake and you 
have a little bit of that sipping whiskey. Those mermaids come out to see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we I'm sure they do. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they do. I mean, he was really so much fun. I couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, well, it, uh, all the wonderful old stories. Ivan Lewis. Thank you, Derek. Yes, Ivan Lewis. And, you know, he passed on, gosh, at least 20 years ago, but oh. he had great, great stories. Another person that had great stories was someone you know, who was Camilio, Sunflower de Fuea. And, uh, you know, those, those, some of those old guys uh, from the Pueblo were so much fun, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> So what what are you doing now? I'm cutting this. So you're are you the cutting design on the lines? Are yes, on the on lines that I drew on. I'm cutting it, uh -huh. and then I'll dig it out. But you know, it carving is hard too, because you know you have to be real careful and not to break your points in your... Do they wear out the... The tools? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I go through tools like crazy. Now, do your hands wear out too? Oh, yeah. They get dry. Dry, dry, dry. Well, I, uh, I've asked a lot of the potters, what do you do to take care of your hands? What do you do? Put lotion on. Lots of, lo <laughs> lots of lotion. A lot of lotion. Yeah, Buy the most expensive lotion to make your hands smooth. Well, yesterday, um, um, Joseph Naranjo was here, and he said that he has a relative or a customer who has lots of cows, mm -hmm. and apparently the cow udders dry out too, just like people's hands do mm -hmm. uh, when, when you milk them, when you milk the cows. And so they sell a product in the feed store. That other the, Yeah, stuff. it's called Bag Bomb. Bag Bomb, yeah. And it's pure lanolin. And he'll, he said what he'll do is put um, that lanolin on his hands and then put a rubber glove, rubber gloves on top of it and, and sometimes even just go to sleep with it on. And uh, what that does all night long is it moisturizes your hands. And he said it really, really makes a difference. Yeah, I'm already used to it, so. <laughs> but I don't need no lanolin crap on my hands. Well, also, Ruby Panana said that, you know, she works with really big pieces and lots of polishing and lots of painting and, and lots of clay rubbing that she has literally rubbed off her fingerprints. Well, I do too. My yeah. nails, I use my nails sometimes to um, scrape off a mistake on my pottery when I'm carving. Uh -huh. And my nail on one side is all worn out. They're all worn out. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Well, it does. But it really uh, takes all the dead skin off you. There we go. Well, you know, if you go to a, a spa, they'll they'll stick you in the mud baths. Yeah. And uh, but it's really weird because when it when it dries, uh, you look like you're a thousand years old with that <laughs> dry clay on you. Maybe older. Well, that's how than my hands are now. Look, yeah. I'm working for today. Wow. Yeah. So it does really dry out your hands and stuff. But yeah. it sure feels good. You live with it. Oh, I have a, a question from, from Dan in San Diego. And the question for you, Sherry, is why are different slips needed for redware and blackware? If you do a reduction firing on the redware, redware slip, will it still look what it will look like after the firing? And will it be black or will it be different? What? So... You have you use a slip for the redware and a slip right. for the blackware. Different. Right. Why do you use different ones? Because 
one's darker and one's lighter. This is paint for black. Yeah. And it's not that red. And I have another slip that's darker than this for uh -huh. the red. So you need two slips. It's or you can use the black slip, but it comes out orange, more orangier. Oh, okay. See, with the black, it comes out orange. So if you, if you reduce the, black, the red slip, if you do, you know, with the cow pies and, and the manure, if you uh, do the red slip and you do a black firing, will the red slip still turn black? Yeah, it'll so, turn black. Is it different than the black slip turning black? Well, I don't know. It just looks nicer, you know, if it's dark. If it's not, you know, it don't look that great. So that's why I use two different. You probably could, you know, but... Does everybody use two different slips for red and black, or is this your little family secret? Um, yeah, a lot of people have paint red for red because, you know, it's a little darker. Uh-huh. And everybody uses this for the black. Dan, I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, <laughs> maybe you can help me rephrase. So let, uh, let me see if I can review this again. You have a, a red slip for red, mm -hmm. and that red comes out uh, yeah. a nice dark color. Yeah. And... Uh, it has a good red base to it. If you use the black slip and fire it red, it comes out an orangey color. Mm -hmm. If you fire both of those pieces, reduction fired, the black is pretty much the same. Right. I hope that. I hope that's. The, I hope that's the right answer. But if you have more questions, Dan, um, let me know. And also, the cotiforms are my favorite group of plants, too. And I don't remember the name of this plant. And I took the, the little slip out of it on, so I wouldn't lose it. And I left it at home. And I failed to look at it to remember what kind of plant this is. Um, and Dan, I told you, is the guy that likes my plants. Oh, yeah. And huh. so uh, we talk about plants just a little bit every day. <laughs> One of the things that I do for fun. What, what, Sherry, when, you know, before and after this pandemic, what do you do for fun? Mm, um, we like to go soak. We go to Ojo or Pagosa and go soak. That's uh, what I like to do is go Pagosa's, soak. Pagosa's, yeah, springs. Pa yeah, Hot Springs. Hot Springs, yeah. Pagosa Springs is in Colorado, and um, uh -huh. Ojo, Ojo Caliente. Right. Um, That's what I like to do. Ojo Caliente translates into hot eyes, and they're just like the hot eyes in, in the earth, and they have all these incredible pools up there and it you know it's turned in it, before it was just an old hippie place mm -hmm. and when you went up there you were wondering whether you know not only were you going to have a great day but you were going to have a great disease as well <laughs> but uh they then changed it into something that is a little bit more shishi and they have arsenic pools and they have soda pools mm -hmm. and they have mud pools and and in a big swimming pool as well. Yeah. And you can spend the whole day there, and they have masseuses and, and scrubs and all kinds of things that you can add on to your experience. And uh, a, some accommodations to spend the night, mm -hmm. and a lovely restaurant where the meals are really, really good, and Ojo is really fun. I mean, it started in the 1930s, and the original sort of bathhouse about two weeks ago burned. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh, uh, big fire. Now, weather, they're closed now anyway closed because right now. Of, the, of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But uh, hopefully they're going to rebuild. But, you know, that was a 
fun old historic building and yeah. you know all the all the old stuff was in it all the old uh, plumbing fixtures and the tiles and all that part was really sort of fun but hopefully they will uh, rebuild it and I, you know I've never been to P Pagosa Springs to sit in the springs have you ever been to the one in the Jemez Mountains? Yeah. Yeah. Those are nice. Those, yeah. those are really nice too. Yeah, and you there's have to the hike in. Yeah. Right there off the side of the road, and then yeah. there's one that is further up into the mountains. Yeah. Yeah, that one was. They're nice. Those ones are nice. And they have beautiful views yes. too. Yes. Uh, really great, but uh, it's uh, lots of hot springs. And, yeah, and, I like you know, to go to those. And there's a Japanese bathhouse called Ten Thousand Waves here in, yes. in Santa Fe too. But that's much Two more, more shishi. modern. Yeah. yeah, it's more shishi than the other sort of fun outdoor places. Yeah. And so, do you go in the winter time too? Yeah, we go winter time, summer time. Any time we can get away, we go. Yeah, get away. Well, the ones up in the Hamas Springs. I mean, if you hike in, and there is, um, I mean, it's not. It's nice and during yeah. the winter time. It's just you know these sort of rock pools with this really hot water in it yeah. uh, all year round, and uh, you know you hike in in the snow. And uh, the steam is coming up off of uh, those pools, and you know, it, there's it's just a wilderness sort of experience rather than something that is more than that. Yeah, it's nice, yeah, it's good for the body after working so much. <laughs> yeah, true, your body needs it, your back yeah. needs it, your hands need it, especially your hands. So is there anything else you do for fun besides make pots? That's about it. Now you have no other job, is that correct? No. No. So this is what you're doing here today is your livelihood. Right. Yeah. This is what I live off of. Well, you know, tell us a little bit more about your mom. Oh, she's, she's been, she still makes pots. She does all her work herself, except for firing and, you know, the hard part, the heavy duty, you know, the yeah. lifting and stuff. Can, can, My brother can, helps can her. Can you whisper it like how old she is? Um, I don't even know for sure, but she's probably about 85, 86. Ah, good for her. Yeah. You know, when you get up that to be that age, you want the whole world to know that A, you're still alive, yeah. and B, that you still can do things, which is wonderful. Yeah, because, you know, all the older ladies were old when, you know, and yeah. they, they were still making pottery till they died. But, you know, it's really amazing because there's something so calming and relaxing, and you sort of zone out when you're making pots and yeah. you know you're not worried about uh you know whether you have enough paper in the the printer um or whether the wi-fi is down or where you left your phone or do you have the right change for the bridge toll <laughs> uh, those kinds of things don't enter into your life at all and as a result you know you can see that these ladies that make pots live long, long lives. Uh, it's something to be said for uh, making pottery, that's for sure. Now, what are you doing with a screwdriver? I'm carving it. Uh-huh. I'm carving out this pot. So I took the first layer out. Yeah. So if you put the pot down where you were working, rough. that's where the camera is. Oh, if you okay. see the camera to your left. <laughs> yeah. If you okay. see the camera to your left, that's, oh, that that's one. Okay. shining down on, okay. that's on how you when you work. That's the rough part. That's the first part. Then I'll get my knife again and um, cut it. Mm -hmm. So your mom made pottery as long as you can remember? Yeah, since they were young. It was since she came back to, the, uh, to Santa Clara after being at the Army base? 
Or did she do it when she was at the Army base, too? No, she did it when they came back. Uh huh. She started when they came back, and she's done it all her life. And this was her career as well? Yeah. Wow. Sometimes we would help the neighbors polish. Pottery. My mom would help them polish, you know. Uh -huh. And they would bring back baskets, baskets full of pots. Uh -huh. And they're all plain, you know, no carving. They're all plain, so she would polish those. And we would sit there and watch her, watch her yeah. polish and stuff. And, uh, and would the, the ladies who brought her the pieces, would they stay and work with her? And no, she and would bosses? do it, and then, you know, they trade it. Off and on, you know, uh -huh. for, you know, somebody will sandpaper her and somebody will polish and, you know, they trade it, jobs. Well, you know, pottery making's always been a family affair. So, of course, you, you know, you work with your family and you help your family. Now, I never met your Aunt Teresita. Oh, no? No, tell me, tell me more about Teresita, because I would love to know. She was something. a famous potter. She oh, yeah. went to the White House. She, had, she did? Yes, she has. Oof. I remember she went and she took a picture. I think Richard Nixon was oh, yeah, president well, at that time. Uh-huh. Oh, well, there's something to remember, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she took a picture with him. I think it was him or Kennedy, one of them. But, yeah, she was a very famous potter. She went all over the place to, you know, sell and demonstrate. And and why was she in Washington to, uh, to get her picture taken with Nixon and or, or Kennedy? Yeah, um, for her work, I guess was it Rick, Rick and Nixon or something. Was, was did her? she get an award or? Yeah, they gave her an award. They I don't know what it was, award. but she got a award. So she was. She was pretty well known. Yeah, Derek, maybe you can put the, the camera that you have back there on just on Teresita's pot so people can get um, a chance to look at them. And uh, Teresita, uh, it was really well known. And one of the reasons that she was so well known is that her Avanu designs were different than other people's. They were more curvilinear, they were more Baroque than they were um, a whole thing. minimalist, as some people do. I mean, they were curvy, and you'll be able to see from uh, her pots uh, how uh, the designs were much more fluid than you see in many of the, the pots then and, and even today. But she also uh, won lots and lots of awards, mm -hmm. and her polish was so good, uh, really good. And maybe she got a hold of some of that dark red slip that drowned in Lake Cochiti, or Cochiti <laughs> Lake, I should say, uh, because the, that dark red slip it appears on a lot of her early work. But uh, we only can get Teresita's pots, obviously, on the secondary market. I know it's really hard for lots of people to give them up for one reason or another, but we're absolutely delighted and we, to get them, and we have a few right now. And Mary King was my aunt. Mary King was your Another aunt. Another yeah. famous potter, too. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and Margaret. And Margaret. Margaret was a... Um, I, I, I don't, you know, you go by cousins and first cousins and second cousins and third cousins, but you don't do that by aunts and uncles, but she was Christina's sister, right. your grandma's sister. My grandma's daughter. She's my mom's sister. She's your mom's sister. Yes, Mary King. Oh, Mary Kane is your mom's sister. And Teresita. And Teresita. Okay, right. your auntie. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's really interesting with Tafoyas and Naranjos at Santa Clara. Yeah. It's Smith and Jones all over again um, because probably at least half the Pueblo 
is named either Naranjo or Tafoya, <laughs> and then the other half of the Pueblo are all the other last names. Yeah. And, and you know, I've, I've heard that, you know, one Naranjo marries another Naranjo, and they're not related at all, uh, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, next, next door to me, um, one of the Trujillo girls married another Trujillo, and, I mean, she went from, um, you know, her first name to her last name of Trujillo to the same last name of Trujillo again, and they weren't related at all either. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, people have been around for so long, and, and uh, the, uh, the separation, and when there are many children, the family trees get really, really spread out, and after... 20 generations, uh, there is very, very little left of that genetic material uh, that they have in common so that they could be called, uh, um, you know, relatives. But uh, now, what about your grandma? Did you, did you know her? Yeah, I knew her. Um, yeah, we would go to her house and she'll be, she be, Making pottery every day. Every day. Just to sit on the floor uh -huh. and make pottery. Yeah. Nowadays we're at a table. <laughs> but it wasn't we don't sit on the floor no more. What, what is it? Was it because she didn't have a table, or was it no, because I that think was, it was the way you did it? Comfortable, more yeah. comfortable to work like that. And we would, you know, help her with her potteries. You know, little things she does, we help her with. And and when did she pass away? Oh, she passed away a long time ago. Over 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Wow. But do you know anything more about Teresita? Um, just she was my aunt. <laughs> was she tall? She, does, was she, she was tall? a short lady. She's a short lady. She was short. Uh-huh. All her aunts are short. Uh-huh. They're probably like, what, 5'1", 5'2". Yeah, they were short. She was a short lady. That's powerful to be able to make those big pots and to, to polish all mm -hmm. of it. I mean, if you have a, a larger pot, especially if it's a storage jar and there is no carving on it, um, you have to polish that piece all at once. All at once. And and it takes a long time to polish. Mm -hmm. Some people are in a big rush and they get all, you know, they don't come out right because they're in a rush or they don't put enough paint on them. And so, you know, it, it, you have to really know how to do it if you, to polish. You have to have patience because it takes me almost... A small pot over there took me almost four hours just to polish. Yeah. You know, a cause big one is all day. Yeah. How do you get anything to eat? Does someone have to feed you? Because you can't stop. <laughs> I take breaks. Yeah. Oh. I take a break and eat. But you're you're always you have your food right here by you, so you're picking at it and working at the same time. Same time. time. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, because I know they said if you stop polishing, when you start again, um, there's a different rhythm. Uh, well, there is a seam. I mean, you can see where uh, one part starts it and the dries other. Dries faster. It, yeah, you know, you'll have dry marks on them if you don't polish it all right away, or if you quit behind between it and then go back to it, it's not going to come out. And, and dry right. marks for polishing mean scratches. Scratches, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you want a uh, even layer of paint and enough so it don't dry. Yeah. Well, this is almost finished carving. Really? I just need to... Um, yeah, see how it's not that deep. This is probably just about an eighth into the clay. Uh huh. But then um, when I finish polishing it, 
and stuff. I have to clean the insides. This part in here. Uh huh. I clean with my exacto. Oh, so you have a piece that's already carved and, and dried. And dried. So yes. does that mean we're going to get to see you polish it? Well, I got to send it. Oh well, let's see you do that first. Then we have, to, you know, we can't okay, disrupt me, the process now, can we? Mess this up. Let me clean this up. And I brought my sandpapers, regular. Yeah. Store bought sandpaper. And before they had store bought sandpaper, what did they use? Um, I don't know. Probably corn cobs. Corn cobs. Huh. Well, that's a good idea, isn't it? They use corn cobs rather than. Or they too. never really send it. You know, you can you, um, do it real smooth, and you know, you can still. And this is my sanding. And you just go around it and smooth it out, get, you know, even it out. Uh-huh. So do you save the dust, too, that comes off of them? Um, I used to. Because yeah. sometimes when you're mixing your clay and it gets too wet, you oh, can put this in there right. and it, you know, dice it out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you age the clay at all? I mean, do you let it sit for, because Thomas Tenorio, who is from uh, Santa Domingo, and Thomas, if you're watching, uh, I'm glad your surgery was a great success and that you're home from the hospital. He was uh, on our, you know, one of our demonstrators the second day, mm -hmm. and the reason he wanted to be early is because he was scheduled for surgery. Oh. And um, now he's home from the hospital and recuperating. And, Good. And I'm glad everything's going well. And Thomas, yay, you, you get well as soon as you can so that you can start making us some more pots. Anyway, do you, do you start off with, uh, oh, he said that he ages his clay for a couple months before he... Uh, begins to uh, do the uh, making the, yeah making the pie um, probably overnight yeah or the next day because you have to let it set your place set that way it gets kind of strong and you know it holds together well, it's but, like it's like soup huh? you know you put you make the soup and you put it in the fridge because it's always better the next day yeah. So we have a question coming from, from the internet, and it is coming from Bob. And, Where's Bob? And Bob would like to know, I don't know where he's from. Can you, can you please review where, review the where the carving style started? I've, ha I've had some of Sherry's work and was drawn to her work by the fine, sharp edges and the precision. So he really wants to know where the carving style started. Do you know? No, I don't. Probably from the, the old people from a long time ago. My grandma, she probably was one of them that probably started it. I'm not too sure. Or Margaret, she could have yeah. been one of the first ones too that started it. I don't, I don't know either I when it started. I don't know either really. And, and was that? Or okay. how it became. <laughs> And also, you know, the sort of repopularization of the black pottery. It was in the, um, the 20s. I mean, people think that Marie Martinez was the person who discovered black pottery, but that's not true no. at all. Um, it not. was made in prehistoric times. I mean, you can find black pottery shards in Everywhere. a lot of the prehistoric villages. Uh, but Maria is is really credited with repopularizing it because in in uh, concert with her husband Julian, uh, they did black pottery and they did it really really well. And as a result, it became popular. But you know, she had contemporaries that were Santa Clara Pueblo and. Santa Clara Pueblo has a long history of black pottery. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, too, made black pottery. But when someone first stuck a knife 
into that, those black pots. Um, who knows when it was? I mean, if you look at the 1880s, um, you'll see a lot of water jars and storage jars mm -hmm. that only have the bear paw in them, yeah. but not um, any other carving. And it's, you know, my understanding that perhaps this is a true legend or it's just a legend that, um, that it was a time of drought, really dry, sort of like it is now. And in the plaza at Santa Clara, they found bear tracks. And someone followed the bear's tracks, and it led them to a water source, maybe mm -hmm. a spring uh, that they didn't know about. And so in order to honor and to thank the bear, that's why the bear's footprint appears on the Santa Clara pots. And I mean, that was a long time ago that that started. But, you know, if anybody knows out there, maybe I should... I don't know who, yeah. whoever... Yep. Invented it or how it came to be, but. Well, we're going to have a couple other Santa Clara potters here. I certainly can ask them and maybe do a little research on my own. Now, what, do you, what are you doing there? I'm putting the paint on it. So, the paint is what? The it's polish. not from Lowe's. Yeah. It's natural paints. So, it is uh, a stone that you grind up? No, it's clay. That's it's fine. clay, so it's... It, it's like a sand but it's... So it's slip. Yeah. Watery clay. Like is it a watery this, clay, yeah. Yeah. Is it the same clay that you use to make the pots? No. no. This is different. And where do you find that? Sort of in the same area? Um, no, I found this paint in San Domingo. It's San Domingo. Yes. Now, we, you can go, you can buzz on down to San Domingo yeah, and take a shovel and... And help yourself? Well, no, you got to get permission, but um, my son-in-law is half from there, so, oh, he, so he gets has permission, and they go and down privileges. and go and get it, yeah. Uh -huh. So he wants his mother-in-law to be happy, yeah. uh -huh. and the way he makes her happy is to uh. go down there and get some of uh, the slip. Right. So you mix that red clay with water. with water and that's it that's it uh -huh. there you dry it out and then you mix it with water because if they're dry it soaks better uh -huh. it breaks up faster when it's dry just like with the clay too we dry it out and then when we soak it it crumbles you know and so do you have to strain it like you strain yes your regular i use a screen uh -huh. i use a screen yeah uh, real fine screen for the clay. But this paint here, I don't use no screen. I don't sift it. I like it like that because of the, the minerals in it. I think uh -huh. if you sift it, it takes it all out. Oh. And I don't know, I just don't like it like that if you strain it. It's too, I don't know, it's not right. <laughs> so you're just really, you're just really painting it on. How, yeah. many, how many coats do you put on? Oh, however, I think it's all right. I don't count. So I don't know. It could be 10, 20. I don't know. So effectively what you're doing is you're putting another layer of clay on top of, on the surface of mm -hmm. this um, structure underneath, the clay structure underneath. Uh -huh. And then I'll let this dry. Now, is it, it's going in the grooves that you cut out, isn't it? Yes, I cut this inside here. Uh-huh. All in through here, I cut out with the X-Acto knife. Uh-huh. But, but this scrape. red, is the red going in those holes? Yeah, it gets yeah. in there, so you have to you scrape it out. Oh. You have to uh -huh. scrape them out. Because if you don't scrape, you know how the edges are all uh -huh. ugly. So you yeah, clean you it all up. You, you don't know. want ugly edges. <laughs> Come on. Oh, sorry. No ugly edges in this place. <laughs> you know, but, you know, you clean it out to make it look good. Some people don't, and it looks rough. Yeah. Well, and what are you putting it on, on the surface with? What A rag. A rag. A oh. rag. So no, no brushes or anything? No. no. Brushes, leaf, 
the lines. Oh. And I don't like that. Well, you know, that's really interesting because that is one of the real giveaways when you start looking at uh, Pueblo pottery that has restoration on it. I mean, if you can see those brush marks on a red pot or a black pot, and especially on a Maria Martinez pot, you know that somebody else has diddled with it mm -hmm. because uh, brushes are not, A, a normal tool, and the process, if, if a brush was used to apply something, with polishing stones and everything, all of those brush marks would all be polished away. And um, that's, you know, one of the signs of something that has been uh, restored. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I use rags. There's people that use paint brushes and yeah. stuff like that. And yeah, all kinds of fancy stuff, you know, they get. Fancy stuff. Yeah, like the the lid from a Skull's chewing yes, tobacco we would can. use those to scrape out the inside of the pot. Uh-huh. Yeah, those are good because they're sharp edges on the yeah. on the tin part. No? Yeah. But now you can't find them because they don't make them tin lids no more. They make them plastic. Oh, so. uh-huh. Uh -huh. What I do is I get a... An oh, old spoon broke on me, so I use that to uh -huh. scrape the inside of my pot. So well, that when the what Ruby Banana um, did is she broke her favorite coffee cup, and it turns out that the coffee cup's curve, the mm -hmm. broken piece, was just the right curve, and that's what uh, she uses to uh, scrape her pots is that broken coffee mm -hmm. cup. Anything, anything you find. You if it works, use it. <laughs> you know? Well, it's nice that you have you that you're inventive, and that you don't have to rely on some retail outlet uh, to supply you with tools. You can just sort of putter around the house. Just my exactos is what I yeah, really have exactos. to buy. <laughs> they, yeah. they, I use that a lot. So, and mostly everything is just you know from the earth. You don't have to. Yeah you know, go out and buy nothing. Well, you know, the the buying public wants to see those nice, clean, smooth edges. And um, the the tools that might be avail available to you in your kitchen might not be nearly as easy to work with and make a, such a clean cut as an exacto knife. Yeah. We used to do so some why not? wood carving tools. Oh, uh huh. That's how I started off. My mom had some yeah. old wood carving tools, so that's how we, I first learned how to use them. And then later on, I got more modern, and I turned to my exactos. <laughs> now, do you buy the exacto blades by the gross? Yes. <laughs> or if I can't afford it that way, then I buy them in separate little packages, which yeah. costs more, but. Uh -oh. Yeah, I, I usually buy a lot. That way I don't run out. Okay, I'm going to polish this. Well, while you're polishing and everybody can watch, uh, what's happening at Santa Clara with the pandemic? Oh, well, everybody's locked up. We're locked up. Nobody can go into the res. Um, so you just no, have to stay no, home? No, no non-tribal members can go into No non-tribal members Clara. can go in. Right. And if I wanted to go visit a friend or do something, I could talk until the cows came home. Yeah, you and still they wouldn't get let in. me in. <laughs> right. They wouldn't right. let me in. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. And what about getting out? You can go out and, you, you know, they just want you to go to town, get things you need, and yeah. go back. And so stay that home. town means Española. Right. Uh huh. Not so much Santa Fe. No. So how did you get out today to come here? <laughs> well, I had my daughter-in-law take me to her house, and oh, then we then, came. And then you snuck out the back door, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is is there a curfew? I mean, do you have um, there Yeah, hours? everybody has to be in the res by ten. What if you don't? What if you don't get back in time? What and do then they you do? get fined. You get a fine. Yeah. Is it curfew? 
Yeah, is it a lot of money to be? Mm, I don't know. I never got caught, so I don't know yeah. how much it is. <laughs> yeah. They say a thousand dollars. So. Well, yeah, I think that's that's a good number to put on it because it's an extraordinary. Yeah, that makes you stay home if you don't want to pay that money. No. You you got it. That means you stay home and just think of how many pots you'd have to make to just to pay for that one mistake. Yeah. Yeah. So. Wow. We, I stay home. I don't go nowhere. And well, there's it, nowhere to go. And so you can go out any day of the week as long as you're back by 10 o'clock. Right. Uh -huh. I know at Acoma they have uh, days restricted by, uh, uh, you know, the letter of your last name. And you can go out on those days. Now, what about kids? Are they allowed to leave Santa Clara? Yeah, but we don't take ours out. We leave them home if we have to go to the store or somewhere. But uh, if we go down to the fields or whatever, yeah. we take them. Would you, do you, are you growing anything? Anything uh, planted? We have corn. Yeah. And we have cucumbers. Yeah. And that's about it. Just corn and cucumbers. Wow. We have a little garden. And they're coming out now, starting to. We kind of did it late. Yeah. Our garden, so, you know. Yeah, we're well, still the waiting. growing season is a little temperamental here because in the springtime we get those late frosts. Yeah. That kills all the fruit. And then in the winter we might, I mean, excuse me, in the fall we might have an early frost that just, you know, wipes out all the stuff that was just getting ready to ripen. I don't know how people did it in the old days. I really don't because, you know, without refrigeration or canning jars, mm -hmm. uh, how in the world did you ever survive? Uh, because the, the weather here is, it has a mind of its own. Okay, now I got this now, first. Tell me more oh. about the pandemic. Huh? Uh, just are there home, many cases just... of... We don't have any on the res. Yeah. But we all got tested. You were you tested? Yes, I was tested. Uh -huh. I got mine in May. Yeah. We were tested in May. And this is my oil that I put on here to make the shine. Oh, okay. Well, that's certainly a little different than some of the people. Well, doesn't that oil burn off when when you fire it? No. No? It dries. Oh, it'll dry. So I'll, I'll polish it till it dries. Oh, I see. So it becomes really part of the mixture of the, the slip that you're putting on the outside. Yeah. And then I just rub it all over on it. Mm. Is it getting a little massage? Is that lavender oil? No. No, or is that salad oil? Cooking oil. Cooking oil. <laughs> You can tell I've been using it forever. <laughs> I love it. The color of your rags, the color of your, your plastic containers, the color <laughs> of that. They, they're all the same color as the clay. I bet you have a whole bunch of clothes at home that are that color, too. Um, I get them from everybody. Yeah. I, I make everybody save their old shirts and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I use them for my rags. Uh -huh. And then you just go over it and over it and over it till it dries. Now you're wiping that stone on your apron, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Because it builds up on your rock and you don't want it to build up because then it'll start scratching your oh. pottery. So, so yeah. you're you're effectively pushing that oil in and and maybe even removing a little bit of that surface while you're polishing. Mm -hmm. Now, do you have a washing machine at home that uh, you wash that apron in? Uh, because uh, I can imagine that... Uh, Let me tell you, it gets all over. gets all over, is <laughs> right. It gets and it all stains. Over. Well, that's what I was sort of getting at, is it gets all over. Yeah, I, no, I just put them in the machine, and afterwards, then I have to clean it out. And, uh -huh. You know, wipe it out, and then it's all right, you know. 
Just don't put it down the drains. You gotta not put it down the drains, or else it's gonna clog your drains up. Oh too. yeah, then you need the, the plumber, huh? Yeah. Then your then your drain turns into a pot. And so I'll just go over and over on it. And so no, Sherry, I was just wondering, where do you get the polishing stones from? From her. <laughs> I got some from her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. He collects rocks, and I bought some. And this one my mom gave me that she used to use. So I use this one all the time. And I bought some. And friends gave me rocks. And we usually go to the river. I get the river rocks too. And then um, polish them up, polish yeah. the rocks up. So you, you inherit, you inherit. Your, your polishing stones, and the ones mm -hmm. you don't inherit, you collect from the river. Yeah, I have a whole bag full of different shapes and sizes. Uh-huh. Like, these ones I'll use for a little pot, and then I have bigger rocks for the yeah. bigger pots. Because you want to uh, cover as much area as you can right away. So if you have a big rock, it makes bigger lines, you know. Yeah. So will you add anything more to that surface and polish it again? Like more of the no, oil? No, this is no. it. This is the That's final it. polish. Huh. Now, do you remember Tina Garcia? Yeah. Yeah, one, one of Tina Garcia's kids swallowed her polishing stones. <laughs> they, he ate them. And so, uh, you know, that that's, first of all, it's dangerous for the child, but you know, your inherited polishing stones that might have been your great grandmother's, your kid ate them. Mm -hmm. uh, but she got them back. So, yeah. Yeah. I got a lot of old ones that I have. Yeah. Well, you know, those rocks in the river have tumbled for eons. And a lot of them, surprisingly, are incredibly smooth, especially if they're made of certain materials. Um, like quartz. Um, yeah, well, I don't know things. what kind of rock this is, uh -huh. but I have a, a onyx rock. Uh -huh. I have a amethyst rock, um, a tiger eye rock. Ooh. Um, it sounds like you have a jewel box <laughs> full of rocks. Yeah, I have all kinds of purple rocks, green rocks, mm -hmm. um, brown. But rock. the color's not important of the rock, no, it's the it's shape of the rock. The shape of the rock, and uh -huh. if it's nice and smooth, you know, and if it, has, it makes wide lines. I like big rocks because they have big white lines, and you cover more area. Yeah, well, especially Little rocks, when you like to... this, you know, forever. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to take big strokes in order, you know. Well, you know, that's part of the reason that miniature pots, tiny pots, can be the same size, excuse me, can be the same price as uh, pieces that are much bigger in size because uh, you use those tiny little rocks to polish and you can use a bigger rock on a bigger piece and so the polishing time may be um, pretty much the same. Uh, now, will you polish that pot on the inside? Um. I could, yeah, but I didn't do it now. You didn't do it now, and it's too late to do it now? Yeah, because yeah. I already put the oil on it, and yeah. it's already going to be shiny. But, yeah, it, it's really hard, though, to polish in the inside. But I like, if I make small bowls like this, I usually polish them all inside because mm -hmm. I like the way it feels. In the way it looks too, because yeah. when you're when you're looking down into a bowl like that, it's always nice to have something on the inside rather than just a you know a flat, plain, unpolished yes. part. Now, after you're done with the polishing, here you let it dry. Yeah, you just it's let dry it dry as a bone. Mm hmm. What happens if we get a lot of rain? Does, that, does the clay take much longer to dry? Yeah, if it gets like if it's like humid, it yeah. takes longer to to uh -huh. dry. So uh, no no 
pot making in Houston, Texas. Because there's too much humidity there. Well, it'd be good for the polishing. Good for polishing, yeah. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's not hot and dry. It's a long way to go, to go polishing. <laughs> Just go in the bathroom and do it. Yeah, do it, right, run the shower, right? Yeah. Run the shower and go do it in the bathroom. Have you ever done that? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Polished in the bathroom. Yeah. Turn on the water and let it run. But there goes your gas bill. <laughs> there goes your gas bill, right? <laughs> Because it runs till the way it gets cold. <laughs> yeah, till the whole hot water heater runs yeah. out. Huh? But good for the skin. Yeah. Gets rid of some of those wrinkles that we all get, we all seem to get. Ugh. We're not going there, though. Uh, anyway, so it's, you're going to get it dry as a bone. Then what happens? Then I'll clean it. I'll clean the insides. So you'll clean out the places that you caught. Yeah. Because the there is yeah. slip residue in there. Right. Is, is that the way that works? Yeah, you clean it out till it's clean, clean, clean. And then um, but you I know, use the same paint to fill in. You have to fill in this part. After fill you in clean what part? It. After you clean out the slip? Yeah. Uh-huh. Then you paint it. So uh -huh. I use the same paint to paint inside here. And but that's unpolished, so it will be it won't be shiny like no. the outside. Uh huh. It'll be dull. So it's but you to know, shine. It's, it's I remember from your pots that the inside carved part is not red. Mm -mm. How does that work? I mean, if you painted red on the outside, and. Uh, and you're painting the same material on the inside of the place, places where you've carved. Why isn't that red also? No, I don't know. Just it, it's different. It, it stays flat. Uh huh. The inside of the carving surface is dull. It, oh, so what you're doing and is you're looking the at shine. the difference between shiny and unshiny. Yeah. Uh huh. And so what I was really sort of getting at is uh, firing. Oh, so, how, okay, you have, do you fire one pot at a time? Um, or do you fire a bunch of them together? No, I usually you? just do one pot at a time. One pot but at if a I time. have small ones, then I'll do all yeah. of them at once. You wouldn't go to all that trouble just for that one. Uh, no. bowl that you have there, you'd have a bunch of other small ones. Right. Uh -huh. But if you had a big pot, you know, it'll, say it'll one just that be was one pot. just one. Okay, yeah. so um, how do you prepare for that? You've oh. gone to the, the mountains, you've gone, gotten wood. Is there any other material that you need? Uh, I use a crate basket. A crate, uh, what's, what's a crate basket? Like, you know how... Uh, like how milk used to come in, in oh, those, and those milk metal crates, crates. Right. Yeah. in glass bottles, no yeah. less, with the cream on top. Mm -hmm. Yummy. And I used those kind of crates to put my potteries into fire, and then I put them on, on just like a regular can, uh, like a vegetable can. You know how uh -huh. high they are. You mean like those big, uh, like those no, big sort of industrial cans no, of vegetables? No, just a regular can corn. You know, like you buy a can small. corn, small, small. can, uh -huh. and I put. I use four of them, and I put my basket on there. Oh, oh, okay. So you put the four cans of corn and or and or green beans mm -hmm. <laughs> on on the ground, right yeah. on the ground in Empty your backyard. Cans. Empty cans. Empty cans. Mm -hmm. um, upside down. Upside down. On, right on the dirt in your backyard. Right. Then you put that metal basket, cr basket crate on mm -hmm. it. Uh, is there, a, if, if you lose that somehow, um, or, you know, it disappears, can you get another one? Yeah, I don't have to go somewhere looking, maybe in a junkyard or somewhere. Oh. Or somebody's yard. <laughs> in somebody's yard, there we go. Maybe somebody went looking in your yard, too. Yeah. But... And, uh, and so you put that uh, um, crate on top of those four cans. Mm -hmm. Then I put my cedar wood on the bottom. Underneath the... Underneath the can. Underneath the, um, underneath the, underneath the basket. Crate. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
and we have to chop our cedar wood very thin, uh -huh. maybe thinner than this knife into little strips. Really? And like, then you put like it underneath. Like paper? Th this thin is paper, real thin? Mm, we don't use paper Yeah. to start it. And then you put the pottery in the basket, and then you put the... Right side up or upside down? Up, right side up. Right side up. Right side uh -huh. up. And then you cover it with a tin on top, so a that way tin. the manure like don't what? hit like the a, pot. Like a piece of... Uh, of uh, a roofing material or yeah. something like that corrugated tin uh -huh. stuff. I'm, we're going to interrupt with a question. We have a question. Yeah, we actually have a couple questions. The first is from Carrie. Carrie would like to know: Does it matter that some of the slip goes into the carved areas? Will it fire differently? No. It won't. It doesn't make a difference. It does. It doesn't make a difference now if it goes into the. Right now it doesn't, but it, after you're I clean it out. finish, yeah, then I'll clean it out and fill it in, and it doesn't make no difference. It's All right, and then another question, it's Bob from Fort Worth again. It seems that the carving is a Santa Clara or a family tradition. Uh, it's a Santa Clara thing, <laughs> Santa Clara Pueblo thing. Well, you know, the, there are two Pueblos that basically do pottery. And one is San Ildefonso and one is Santa Clara. And coincidentally, their land butts, butts up against each other and the, the Rio Grande passes through the center of each one of these pueblos. And um, they both do black pottery. And they did black pottery a gazillion years ago as well. But it wasn't until Margaret de Foya um, no, I should say it wasn't until Maria Martinez sort of repopularized it in the late uh, teens and early twenties, mm -hmm. and and it, and it it you know caught on again, and uh, many many great potters rose out of that tradition, um, and so. Oh, uh, I mean, what was what was my point? <laughs> so I have another question, and it's from Serena, and Serena, and she would like to know when you put your signature on the bottom. After all the work is done, right before the firing. Right before the firing. Yeah. Do you ever forget? Yes. And what do you do if you forget? Oh, I just wait till it's done, and then I scratch my name on. So it's scratched into the surface. Yeah. Yeah, you know, always be a little leery when something on the bottom's written in pencil. Yeah. I usually, what I usually do is I'll wet the bottom part after I finish, and then I'll use a pencil or one of my polishing stones uh -huh. and sign my name. Because so it's, it's in, in the in clay. There, yeah. It's in the clay. That's right. you know the usual way yeah. uh, pieces are signed right in the clay before you start. Any more questions? That's it for right now. But if anybody else has any questions, they can please just let us know through the chat window on YouTube. That's an easy way, or send us an email to info at andreafisherpottery.com. And you know, if we haven't satisfied your the answer to your questions, please you know ask again, and uh, we we hope that because we want to make sure that uh, you understand what's going on. Okay, so four cans of corn, well, three cans of corn and one can of green beans, mm -hmm. uh, the metal basket, um, the cedar Oops. thin pieces of wood underneath the metal basket. The pot is put into the, the metal basket, and a piece of metal, like a piece of roofing material, tin. a tin, is put on, on the top. Now what? Then you put your other wood. You put your slab wood around it so on wooden? the outside of the basket. What do you mean by slab wood? Slab wood is like um, the bark, the bark from trees. You know, bark. like you can get uh -huh. from the sawmill. Yeah, we go to sawmill. Well, we you get go the and you get the the tree bark yeah. because that's something they can't use. Right. So we use that uh -huh. and we cut them to size and put it around the basket and then put some on top and just and then light it 
and so start the, the wood, so the, the piece of metal that you put on the top, is it the same size as the, the metal basket? It's a little bit bigger. A little bigger. To so. where it'll hang over on the side. And then you stand the wood up. So stand the, the bark, wood up. Excuse me, the bark. You stand the bark up, mm -hmm. and then you put bark on the top. And then you light it from the bottom. And then you bottom. light it from the bottom. You light it from the bottom, and then you just let it burn, burn, burn. And then you check it every once in a while. It turns a certain color. Do you, do you add more enough. wood to it ever? No, no. No, just that one go just around. Just that one time you uh -huh. put your wood and you let it burn. And then once your pot comes to a certain color, then you put your manure on. Do you, well, do you have a little peephole or something where you can see the Yeah, you the can pot? check between the, the, between the wood. Uh-huh. There, there's enough room to where you can see. And it's all visual. I mean, there's no yeah. thermometer or anything that no. where you measure the, the temperature. No. Some people um, time it. Yeah. But I don't. I make sure it's that color I when, need yeah. in order to put my manure. So I, I I check it every once in a while, and then when I get that color, then I put my manure on it, and I smother it out, and then I leave it there for maybe about an hour in well, the manure. Well, I, I want to go back to the wood. Uh, what, what happens if you accidentally have a piece of bark that isn't perfectly dry? What happens uh, to your firing? It might steam it. Steam it. Yeah, and it crack your pot. Oh. Because you don't want to use wet wood because, you know, as it's drying and it's hot, it steams, yeah. no, so it'll crack your pot. Huh. So you need dry, you dry wood. You save the steaming for asparagus. Yeah, and or not for, for something pots. else. <laughs> yeah, for something else. Another question, too, is how do you know where, do you, does the ground that you put the cans of corn on have to be perfectly dry too? Yes, your ground has to be dry. Everything has to be dry. Okay, so everything has to be dry. What happens dry, dry, dry. if Mother Nature decides that she's gonna send you a gust of wind? What happens to your pot then? Um, sometimes it could um, overcook. You can overcook your pots. Uh huh. And it, and that's why you don't fire on a windy day. Yeah. Use a calm, nice day. Do it early if you can. Well, it sounds like there are lots of variables, and if you screw up on one of them, all that work that you've done is gone. Yep. Whoa. Okay, so you've torched this... Uh, um, pile of wood and metal and cans and, and a piece of pottery in the center. Uh, how Do you let it burn down so that the wood becomes ash? Uh, for the red pots you can. Yeah. Because you don't put the manure on for oh, the so, red pots. Oh, so if you're going to fire this red, when that um, ash, when that wood burns to ash, the process is over. It's done then. It's yeah. done. But um, then you need to let it cool, cool down. Cool off, and when it cools off, then you open your container. For the red, you need a, a closed-in container. So the basket doesn't work. Does no, not it? for the red. So what do you what do you use? Some kind of a metal container? Yeah, that you, put you know, it in? I I got metal things that I put together uh -huh. to make a box. Yeah. And. Uh, we put it in there and then we fire it. So the red firing, you need four cans and the cedar a metal, wood. the metal box, uh -huh. and so you don't need it. Do you need a lid on the top? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course you need, you need a, a lid on top, and then you put how would your you wood. Get, how would you get the pot in if you right. didn't have a lid on top? Duh. Uh, and so the metal, the metal box, the metal lid, the standing up. Um, bark mm -hmm. and the bark on top. You torch it. You wait until it, it burns, up. and um, and you let it sit there afterwards and let it cool. How mm -hmm. long does it take to cool down? Oh, sometimes it takes maybe a couple of hours. Uh huh. 
Yeah, so you have to be real careful when you take it out too, you know. It's real hot, so we usually just put it on the ground and let it cool off. Well, it's, you know, in your backyard. Yeah. You, you know, you can go out there, I'm sure, and check on it while you do other things yeah. until it's cool. But um, if you decide to, to uh, fire it black, um, you've already done a different slip on it, so that decision to, on the, what the color is going to be like is made uh, before you start polishing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're going to fire it black. Mm -hmm. So the cans of, of corn go down on the ground, then that metal basket mm -hmm. uh, goes on top of that, then the pot goes inside, then the cedar goes underneath the metal basket, and the, um, the metal goes on top, and then the you do the wood. same thing with the, the, the ring of bark that's mm -hmm. standing up and, um, around the pot, right. and then you put more mm -hmm. uh, bark on the top, the and, you, like, mm -hmm. and you light that. Yeah, and then you just cover it up, and then you put the wood around it, uh -huh. and then you, then you light it. Then you light and it. And then it, just let it burn. And you let it burn. Mm -hmm. Now, you want it to be black. Um, you let it burn and it turns a certain color. Yeah. Because once you put it in there, it's going to go black. It turns black. And then after it fires a while, it, it'll turn red like this again. And then that's when you put your manure on. And so you put the manure on. Now, is the manure dry? Dry. Dry. Yeah. Dry, uh, dry manure. Does, how does it smell? <laughs> uh, oh, awful. Awful. Oh, awful. Now, how do you smell after that? Awful. <laughs> awful. Uh, awful. 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 Uh, it's and almost like a smell of a skunk. <laughs> oh, no, maybe a skunk smells better. So if you, if you, like we say, if you smell the manure burning, it's like gold. Our horse manure is like gold. Wow. Okay, and so the, you put the manure on, and it's dry. Is it um, in cow pies, or it, is it powder? Uh, is it powdered? Dry and powdery. Is it horse or cow or sheep? Horse. Or? Horse. Okay. In yeah. your case, horse. I use horse. Okay. You can use cow patties too. Yeah. You you instead of using the bark wood, you can use. Cow patties. Cow patties, okay. But that's so, a lot harder to So you, keep do you, up. you shovel it on? <laughs> yeah. Shovel it on quickly? Real quick. Real quick. And how about how thick is the manure um, uh, on, on the you know, on the whole structure that you've built there? Um it's pretty thick because you smother it till the, there's no smoke and you actually cover it. Sometimes they're it looks like a big old grave, you know. You put enough to where it covers all the wood uh -huh. and everything, and it don't burn. So you yeah. have to go out every now and then and check it to see if it's not burning. If it's yeah. burning, then you put more manure on there. Oh, oh! So you're really smothering that fire. Smothering. But now. what's close to the pot is probably burning, and yeah. that's what takes the oxygen out of the clay. And that's why the pots yeah. turn black. Okay. And they're this black the... all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh, if you break one of them, you can see that uh, uh, they're it's... not the shiny black. They're that gray, oh, gray, gray color. color all gray. the way through. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you have to let that cool down. Mm -hmm. That must take longer if it has all that manure on top of it. No, it takes a couple of hours for them to cool off. Yeah. Depends on how big they are. Yeah. And stuff, so, and then well, I put them on the ground. So sometimes, yeah. you know, uh, like summertime, we put them on the ground because it's not wet. Yeah. But winter time, I usually just take them out and take it inside and put yeah. it on my bottom of my fireplace because it's rock, no. Yeah, and so they, I just they can finish put cooling right there and there. cool off. Yeah. yeah, nice way to heat your house. And if you do it late at night, you can stick them in the bed. <laughs> and then your feet are all nice and warm when you crawl in the bed. No, that's not uh -huh. what they do. <laughs> I'm sorry. This was just a, 
the imagination gone wild. But, but uh, before, what would I love to have you do, Sherry, is that before we sign off, can you spend a couple more minutes talking about the pots that are over there? And, and Derek will get all that prepared for you. And in the meantime, we'll talk for a, a, a few minutes while he sets up cameras and all that stuff. And he'll let you know when it's sort of time to go over there. Okay. But um, so, you know, we've seen the whole um, spectrum of how to make a pot from the, you know, the day that you go out to the, uh, the hills to go dig the clay until that piece cools off in the, in the backyard. And, you know, and on all the other ones, we sort of never got around to doing all the details about how you actually fire the piece. And, you know, what, it's, it's a lot of work. It is. It's a lot of work. People Tell, think it's easy, but it's not. It takes a lot of work. So you start with the clay and you make pots. Those pots that you make, how many of them go to your, to cool off in your backyard? How many do you lose along the way for various reasons? Yeah. Sometimes I would lose maybe two. Three, depends. Two or three out of how many? Maybe about mm, five. Half of them? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes half, they Sometimes break. half of them? Yeah. Or oh. all of them? Or all of them. Oh, yeah. geez. That's even It depends worse. on how well you make them. Because if they pop, it's an air bubble in it. Yeah. Yeah. So they usually pop if they have air bubbles in them. That's what every single potter has said when they're doing the firing, when they hear that pop. You go, Poof. Yeah, and, and you that's know. That's it. You already know you just want to quit. <laughs> yeah, something really went wrong there when that, mm. that magical sound happens. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you make a thousand pots, really only a 500 of them survive. Is that Could. correct? Could be. Could, Could. be. Yeah. Um, I would think that with all your experience, that that might be more. But, you and know, there's always, sometimes, you know, you get a bad, you make a bad pot. You know, it's yeah. one of those days. Yeah, yeah, you know, other people have said they sometimes have a, a bad batch of clay. Yeah, yeah, or you yeah. don't get the right clay, or you don't mix it right. Yeah, it could, or clean if you don't it put right. enough sand, yeah. or have enough clay in there, then it will, you know. So there's always some little something mm -hmm. that will make them. Yeah. You know. Are you ready, Derek? Yep, I'm ready. Okay, well, Cherry, if you want to go over there and talk uh, a little bit about your pieces, I'll tell people what's coming up. Uh, Tomorrow, we have Jackie Shativa. Uh, she does these great white corrugated pots, and she has, she has been one, one busy girl. There was a, a Ricardo Cate cartoon in the, uh, the newspaper, and Ricardo Cate is a cartoonist from Santa Domingo Pueblo, and he does lots of stuff about the reservation. It's, there he's really funny. And if you're not familiar with him, you might just, uh, check him out on the website, but uh, there was a cartoon last week where this woman, with an Indian woman in her traditional dress and her, and her Indian husband are all standing there, the two of them are standing there, and there's this whole field of pots, and what she says to him is, I've been really busy during this pandemic, uh, but so has Jackie Shativa, so we're going to have a tremendous number of pieces of her work. Uh, and then uh, on Friday, Friday is um, Sammy Naranjo and his significant other, Melanie Gutierrez, and they do this very intricate scrofito work and lots of geometric shapes and, and lots of little fun surprises on them. He does pots and she does turtles, and the turtles are really, really sweet. And on Saturday, oh, Saturday is going to be a fun day because Carolyn Concha is coming. And Carolyn is one of the Lewis sisters from Acoma Pueblo. 
Marilyn, Carolyn, Rebecca, Judy, and Diane. And we're having all five of them come, but separately, only because their work is varied a little bit. But they are the noisiest, most fun people in the universe. And whenever those sisters get together, whatever space they're in, they just fill it with laughter. Even, even the great outdoors is just filled with laughter when the five of them are together. But this is Carolyn's work. She does plates. She does seed pots in the membrane designs with a little bit of color. And the color is all from the natural pigments that she collects in, in New Mexico. And then Tuesday, because we do these Tuesday through Saturday, on Tuesday we're going to have Candelaria Suazo, who is also from Santa Clara, who does sgraffito work with lots of butterflies and, and hummingbirds and really, really, uh, really nice pieces. Uh, then that will be, that she will kick off the last week that we're going to do this. There's a series of 20. We are now on number 12. Uh, I'm happy to say, and uh, looking forward to all the rest of them. You can go to our website and see all the pieces that we have for sale, which benefit the artist because of the cancellation of Indian Market. And also, um, you can see their individual pieces and, uh, by going to our website, clicking on their name, uh, and going from, you know, then their pieces will appear. If you want to uh, see a repeat of this performance or you missed uh, a little bit of it, you can go to YouTube and then search for Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery. And all the um, videos that we have done so far are up there, except for today's. In a couple hours from now, it will be posted up on YouTube. And we will continue to do that until the series is complete. We've had a lot of calls from potters who say, oh, it looks like fun, can I do it too? And uh, we're not, we're gonna actually continue and do some more, but not for a couple months. Uh, uh, I'm probably gonna sit in a hole somewhere and not talk for a long time because um, that's what I seem to do all day, every day. And we hope that you will join us tomorrow. We hope that you will tell your friends. We hope that you will subscribe on YouTube. And uh, I will now turn it over to Derek so that um, we have the opportunity to see uh, these wonderful pots. Uh, that well, I'm over here with Sherry, yeah. and Sherry has these beautiful pieces, and uh, she has one in her hand, and uh, what, what can you tell me about it, Sherry? Um, uh, I don't know. Well, I so first, it. the design is in a vanu, correct? Uh, yes, the water serpent. Mm -hmm. and, and water's really important in this state, isn't it? Right. It's our lifesaver. <laughs> and... <laughs> This is the uh, lightning from it, the mouth and the eyes, and the mountains, water waves. And then we have the Kiwa step right here. This is all water, the waves, and more like mountains. And then this right here. And uh, your favorite part, you said, is the, is the polishing, right? Polishing, yes. Yep. It, it's calming and, you know, it's the best part <laughs> of doing the pottery, besides yeah. making. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah well, I, I don't think that the digging of the clay is the most pleasurable part. No, that's a lot of hard work, so we need a lot of men to dig for us. And it takes hours and hours to dig for our clay and our sand. And we take the whole family with us, and we do. And that's it. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful piece. And so uh, the shape that you make, is there a name for it? I call it my lamp base. Okay, but you're not, you don't want to use it for a lamp, right? No. But there's been people that make lamps out of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to buy it and you want to make a lamp, you can make your own lamp. Yeah, but does, doesn't there need to be a hole that is drilled well, yeah, you somewhere have for to a cord? Do your, 
own hole right here, or you can have someone make you and put you the hole right away, you know. But I've seen a lot of them that have been made into lap shades. Mm -hmm. And they look really nice. Yeah. Well, uh, the, it is a beautiful piece, and we have some other pieces of your of your families that are behind you as well. Right. Um, and so there's a red one as well by Teresita. Uh -huh. And what is the whole symbolized? Can you tell me about some of the designs on that guy? Um, there's the water. Mm -hmm. There's the Kiva steps again. And the rain. Here. Mm -hmm. And the water. Kiva steps. This could be mountains or you know, water, water waves. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously water is a very pro is a pretty is a pretty important symbol for Santa Clara, correct? Mm -hmm. And well, off, after all, we do need water to live. Right. Um, and in this area, we get very very little rainfall. Uh, very little. Uh, even though we got a, we were lucky enough to get a little bit yesterday, we weren't. Uh, it wasn't really enough to be a drought buster, and we definitely need a drought buster. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, well, I want to thank Sherry for being here. I think uh, we had a great time. Uh, we learned a lot, a surprising amount about pots, um, a surprising amount about polishing and polishing stones, where they come mm -hmm. from. And you're the first person to do a demonstration on carving uh, today. So oh, yeah. it was really quite fun to see the carving because it kind of went from a rough to a smooth mm -hmm. carving. And, you know, I'd always been curious about that. So I want to thank you, Sherry. I think it was wonderful that you were here today. And uh, I'm going to pass it back over to Andrea. If she has anything else to say, she can uh, let us know. I always have something to say. <laughs> That's part of the problem. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted to do is to say, Sherry, thank you. Thank you for participating. I know that you were a little bit nervous when all of this started, but I think that uh, just sort of faded away really early on. And uh, I am really, really uh, delighted that you took the time and that you showed us the whole process and you told us all about the firing, uh, which, you know, is really, really a, an intricate part of it. And that, uh, I don't. I know that I had a really good time, and I hope the same thing is true for you. And uh, again, thank you, thank you so much for who you are and what you do, because it enriches all of us. No, thank well, thank you. you very much too for having me here today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, if anybody has any questions, it's kind of the last call. Um, do them right away. That would be just great. And. You know, Sherry didn't have very many pieces today, and that we understand. But we would just love to be able to uh, um, take any orders uh, if anyone's interested. Uh, as they say in the shopping network, uh, operators are standing by. We have <laughs> Eric and Alan Amy today, and we certainly can put anyone on our uh, request list. And that if you, uh, and Cherry's really good about filling requests. That's because we've had experiences with her in the past. And of course, there's no obligation. Uh, we have a question? We, we don't have a question, but more of a comment. And the comment is uh, from Priscilla. And Priscilla says, thank you for a nice uh, demonstration from one of my favorite artists. Well, oh, thank you. Oh, isn't that <laughs> thank nice? Thank you very much. Yay, yay. <laughs> Well, are we just about? Yeah, I think we're ready to just, sign off. Well, that's a nice cheery note to sign off on. Thank you, Priscilla, for providing that.